Hey, it's Coffee Compiler Club. We're once a week talking about compilers and language runtimes and typing systems and anything to do with the language implementations. Uh, no, no set agenda. You're all being recorded live. You'll be up on, you know, YouTube videos within a couple hours. Um, and that's my that's my opening spiel here. So I have an AA update, and then uh, you know, floors open here. Oh, here's more stuff on the chat though. Um, and actually I wanted Cameron in, so why don't I pause until Cameron's back? Um, somebody else have something you want to talk about here? Because I'm going to talk about variance and covariance and Henley Milner. Yeah, I see, I see Theodore's like smiling and grinning at me here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> okay, fine. Ludovic, did you want to talk about stuff? Because we, we, we chatted a little bit. Um, there he is. I, I'm I'm deep into move constructors and copy constructors of C plus plus and how uh, difficult it's made. But that uh, <laughs> yeah, C plus plus stuff. Yeah, I I in the in the land of C two at Hotspot, I used operator new and operator mm -hmm. delete. But then I I kind of you know stopped at that point. I have just made a mess. All right, and Cameron's here, so I'm going to do my agenda thing after I clean up spilling coffee on myself. This is a running joke between me and Lisa, by the way. So I'm spilling coffee on myself all the time. Um, it's a sign of genius. Trust me. Excellent. <laughs> yes, yes, it's a sign of genius. Yes, clearly. <laughs> I claim that with all seriousness. Better I get my coffee then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And your dribble cup. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am no doubt at this point, a serious genius. Excellent. Yes. Well, I think I'm falling in the same camp right now. <laughs> also can't tie my shoes. Can't, uh, yeah. Okay. Fine. That one, that one, yeah, they have Velcro for that. Not that I'm claiming air still. Okay. So we're going to do this AA update thing. So I started down the path of, hey, I can do this with Henley Milner. I've known this for a while, and I, I'm certain I could do this in Henley Milner. This is variance, sorry, variance and covariance, automatic inferral, which means you don't have to put annotations about whether you want plus or minus on your types to be super or subclass acceptable. Um, there he is, Jim. So I, I produced some more test cases, promptly hit a bug, went back to my typing stuff and cleaned out, you know, another thing I had done a long time ago that I thought I had all worked out and turns out that I had screwed up in some corner cases because I hadn't tested it vigorously enough. And now I'm testing again and I'm running out of corner cases here. I haven't added a new feature in quite a while. And I keep like, like each feature that I've added at some point in the past gets a round of, oh, this is not quite right. So that's what's happened here. So I have mostly got examples to get us as far as here's subclassing with Henley Milner. And I don't have variance ones. Um, but I can, I'm certain I can get there. And so I'm going to make an effort to switch to Google Docs and do a live, not really live. Add this to my fine Google Docs. Here we go. I'm going to make an effort to throw down some series of code examples of ever-increasing complexity to show what I'm doing with subclassing and Henley Miller. So like, like here, here is a, a, a basically a list of object in Java terminology, something like this. So it basically has no constraints on what items you put in the list. It's just a linked list. There's a next element and a value payload. And I build a couple elements in the list and show them. And here is Dan. Let me, let me throw Dan in here. Man, people are just gonna be bigger day here. Okay, so um, is that is that like obvious what's going on there before I go to round two? The type accepts a structure, maybe? It's not list a... is a function, uh -huh. which yeah. returns a structure, which is, it's a yeah. list is a constructor of a linked list element. 
Yeah, but it admit, admits uh, accepts anything that has uh, these fields next and above. Yeah, right. There's no constraint even on what the next field is in this example. Yeah. And I'm going to start adding constraints. So okay. if you use list politely, you'll get a linked list. Because there are no constraints, you can abuse it and get something that's not a linked list. So it's not really a list of object yet. Yeah. Okay, okay cool. So here's one where the Google indenter has gotten confused, and I can't see why. And what I'm trying to do here is force value to be an integer. And, and that's because I don't have an instance of type checking assert in the pure lambda calculus. So this is core AA, so like a, basically pure lambda calculus. So it's all parens and curlies. There's no C style function calls and there's no types that you can write in the code. So I'm going did to you mean, force- Did you mean enter deck? It's a list of integer because the value that you get out of deck is ignored. It goes into dummy, we call dummy ignore like this. Would you like it maybe this way? And the only thing that happens is it forces value to be an integer type. Because I don't have a I don't have a an annotation in core AA that says, and this has to be an int or else you're a type error. So I'm really trying to make list of int here. Um, let me let me do. So dec is an operation that does a decrement. Yes, sorry, decrement oh. subtract. Oh. Yes. And this forces the type to be an integer. Yes. So at the time I was writing core AA, I was looking for the minimal set of primitives to do things with that doesn't do anything useful necessarily. Like add is a two element, two input, and denker is a one input. And they both force you to be integer. So that's why it's, I'm using decrement. Yeah. It has no other purpose than to force. And so uh, this is a type error here. Let me make sure that I believe myself. Yes. So in, in the, the list zero, list in zero, this is fine. And when I try to put a string into a list event, I get, I get an error. Okay, why not? Uh, underscore, I could, I, I, I don't believe I have underscore as a valid identifier in core AA because core AA is really dumb. It takes shortcuts on parsing. Now the parser here is like a hundred lines of code. It, it takes shortcuts on parsing. Um, no parser should be less than 5,000 lines of code. Uh, <laughs> agreed. But you know, here I am in the, in the land of, I'm, I'm trying to show, show something about type theory it has nothing to do with parsing. So the language is sort of brutally minimalistic. I couldn't tell. You couldn't tell. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Let me go and go next step up. Get some space in there. So this is a, a list generic. And the 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 difference here is that because I don't have a type annotation that I'm writing the language, I'm going to fake a generic by putting a constraint in that I'm going to uh, uh, go back to more here. I'm going to put a constraint in that I have to specify via code and spec instead of specifying being a type. The code forces a type in a, in an actual language. I would just let you name the type and you would just force the type with the type name. But I don't have type names in core AA, but there's a syntactic sugar way to get this out of any sort of other language where you just take a type name where I'm putting in a function which forces a type. So the generic keyword is actually just a generic variable. It's a function which is gonna force my type because I'm gonna run it once on your value and then ignore the result. So that would mean it's empty is only available for strings, for example. Yes. All right. And not for ints. That's correct. So I need some sort of string like function that only accepts a string as a primitive and a function that only accepts an int as a primitive. That those are the two choices I've picked here. I could put down is int and is string, if you like. That's their their goal, their purpose. And there'd be a type error. If you call is string with something other than a string, it's a type error. 
So is string only ever can return a true because it'll be a type error if it's anything else. Okay, and so then I build a couple of lists of ints and strings and I throw them in a pair so that when I run the test case, I get both ints and both strings as results back out. So does that make sense here? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. I need somebody to say something. Yep. Oh, yep. Okay. So now I'm going to do um, a version where I'm going to uh, force you to not be able to mix lists of ints and lists of strings, but you can do that right now. And what happens here is, uh, is I just look at the next element in the list and run my type checker, the generic function, on the next element, which means the next element has to be same type as this element, has to be same type as recursively all elements in the list. Hmm. So I make a list of int, uh, one element, this is OK. I make a list of string, and this is a type error which I'll get out and I check in my test cases and all that because I try to put a list of string and I append a list of ints to it and I get a two element list. The first guy has a string, the second guy has an int, but list of string only accepts other things that have strings in the second position. So, and, and therefore recursively in all positions. So at this point I have built something that I claim looks very much like a, a generic list in just pure code, and I type check things such that it only type checks as a list of pure ints or a list of pure strings. Furthermore, the list is generic, and I can just put whatever type I want for the generic word and get a list of whatever generic thing I want. And 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 mostly, I'm trying to show here that I can go type check generics, um, where int and string are basically subtypes of objects, and so the subtyping rules would apply here in that sense. If your generic tester accepts a, a person and employee is a subtype of person and the generic also accepts employee, then a list of person would accept employees as people. Hmm. How so, course, uh, one question. Well, yeah, how yeah. so when the list in the list and int, I get yeah, that it's parameterized now as an int. When you pass a string, it's a type and error, but uh, uh, doesn't try to unify uh, int and a string and go to object. It uh, it, it will it unify int and string and then declare that an error because actually okay you're right so int and string I, I was a little a little facetious there int and string will not unify. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, they don't have a, 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 a unification on the in the in the land of Henley Milner here is all purely structural. They There's don't no class have hierarchy. an Object can, type. Uh, the, yeah, there's type. no object type. You can build a class hierarchy, mm -hmm. um, okay. but it's done with structures. So ints so, and structures are never in the yeah. same hierarchy. Yeah. So this is a type error because they're they yeah. cannot. Be... And, and and if I instead only used uh, structures, mm -hmm. and I had a structure representing object and a structure representing capital I integer and a structure mm -hmm. representing capital I a capital S string, then it would get the same exact behavior. Mm -hmm. Eventually, under the hood, the the type checker in the generic type checker would run against, uh, you know, a, a capital S string against a test that verifies capital I integer, and you would get cannot unify int and string and yeah. blow you out. Yeah, that's that's cool. Okay, but I think even if you if you have an object type, as long as your generic function is not testing for an object type, it wouldn't it wouldn't matter, right? Because you, you would still Dismiss yeah. of the of the integer. Your your limitation is whatever will pass the type check on your generic function for every member of the list. So if you make a weak generic function, it will pass via types only. No 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 execution of generic. Just types only will pass everything that passes your weak generic test. If you make a very sharp one, a very precise one, it'll only accept what it takes. So you can choose to be more or less super subclassy as you want for your list here. And then I'm out of examples because I ran and did bugs for all the rest of the week.
and I added a blind and I fixed light bulbs and I got my water sorted out and I found a dead deer against my fence line. And I'm not lying here and a tree branch, a large one fell over the fence line and it's still up and it will crush the fence unless it gets removed and things happen. So Life fun. happens. We're watching so, vultures and bobcats finish the deer hmm. from the deck. It's kind of an, a surreal experience. Hmm. It's fine. You're in a nature documentary film hmm. out your back door. So sorry, never mind. <laughs> Is it possible to force instead to be one type or something like um, each list and each member of the list, each next member of the list can it be its own type? And the type grows. Linearly. I'm sorry. Say, say that again. The, the is it possible to force the list, the list, the linked list type to be more of an age list, where age, where each uh, instance of the list, the next instance of the list, has its own type. The first has an int. The second uh, leaf of the linked list has a type string. And uh, yeah, that's the type... that's the first list I got up to front here. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you highlight if you see it. The thing yeah, I call just list love, object. Just don't as long do as you any, don't have a don't type do check. anything with the type, right. then it takes yeah. anything. Yeah, exactly. But it so doesn't the question, is, the question yeah. is, Cliff, do you like this result? <laughs> um, what I want out of it is a a theoretical proof that I can build types when I go when I build people the types that people would like. When when I when I go out of core theory and I go to AA, what I have now is a, a strong theoretical result, and I'll just need some syntactic sugar from AA to get me that theoretical result. So do I like it as a way to code things in a core language? I don't want to code in the core AA language. So I don't care what it looks like in core AA. It can be but ugly, and it pretty much is. What I want is a way to have a strong theoretical result. So when I go to the main AA language, I have a strong theoretical background, and then it's up to me to make that look good and, and run efficiently. And th those are sort of more straightforward. Typically, the core the core language has to be small, understandable, and provable. It has to be small, and understandable, and and give me a strong you know provable guarantee. So I don't have does, proof. And it does not have a concept of a nominal type. It does not. No. It has no no concept. That's correct. It has only uh, a pure lambda calculus types. So there is no. So I'm building it nominal. Kind of, kind of reminds me of like linguists when they try to figure out those tonal languages. You know, they're, they're like, you know, yeah. Yeah. what's the verb? What's the subject? What's <laughs> right? So how so, do you spell that tone? <laughs> well, th so this result that I'm showing here has been known in the industry for a long time, and I only find hints and pieces of it from like papers from the '70s where somebody says, oh, and of course you can just get nominal and structural types of a little syntactic sugar. And then they, they blah, 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 and they carry on and they don't expand, right? And I kind of had an intuition, oh, okay, that kind of makes sense, but I didn't, so here I'm like, okay, fucking do it. <laughs> and, and that's the difference between like reading something, you know, 30, 40 years ago, or some, some you know, Cousseau, Cousseau, highly theoretical person has come along and said, of course, this is easy. It's just syntactic sugar, and then they carry on da, 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 down into the land of denotational semantics, and you're like, oh, fuck, you know, hmm. give me give me something I can code on. So here I am coding up a variant. Probably there's a much more clever way to code this up. I have a variant that I claim at least looks like it produces the correct constraints. Gives me a type error when I wanted a type error, and it lets me build things up that I want to build. Now, the other piece of this that I don't have examples for is that the variance covariance the discussion that went around Discord is that I can totally infer variance and covariance, if you will, automatically because it's a bi because Hindman is bidirectional, so he can take it both directions and discover that you're you're uh, only reading from this structure, therefore I can I, it's effectively immutable, and I don't care if you hand me super classy or subclassy things because I'm going to. I'm only going to read. Whereas I'm going to write, I'm going to claim that when I'm done writing the list or the container class got stuff with things that were not going to pass my generic test and then I'll blow up at you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. One of the things I learned as well this week that this reminds me of is that uh, I was, 
chatting with someone about bidirectional uh, type inference. And they pointed out that it's not just within a particular expression or a particular line of code that some implementations like, like this one can use later inductive reasoning to, yeah. to help with the inference of earlier statements. So in a sense, um, your later statement of ignore whatever yeah. impacts the declaration in this case, within which that ignore is found, but it's, you know. So it's... what Henley Milner does is he lifts from your textual representation a series of constraints that are, you know, unified via the disjoint set union into an ever more complicated, more complete type from all over. So things you get from one end or the other of the program all fall into the same bucket of bare types that are then unified piecemeal until you get the final answer. And in that sense, it's no longer, you know, it's still, um, it's still one pass efficient, but the pass is not in the order of visibility of the syntax. The pass is in order of when things have been touched in the uh, uh, in the in the disjoint set union, like the, the accumulation in the set union keeps accumulating. And then you go to wherever you touched last and you do a little bit more work and then you touch something else. So you do a little bit more work. Is that My interpretation make... would be that the type is figured after the fact. It's not it's not uh, put up front if you yeah. if you and you just have a type variable and keep constraint constraint and after the fact you figure out what the type should be and not the type you want it you type it to be <laughs> well you, you get a type out which is right what the what the inference tells you specifically this is your type and then you might agree or disagree or you wanted something but you'll get that this is the type and now but I didn't want that type is the usual thing. And I wanted a different type. And so you have to go hack. So the contra covariance would come to play if you if you can enforce syntactically, you tell it what the type should be. And yeah. later, yeah. It is okay. my belief that I can enforce syntactic agreements of contra and covariance. You, you, you could choose to say, I want to enforce this kind of variance and then I can enforce it. If you do not, I will do work out whether you were contra or covariant and confirm that you kept all your other invariants in place, such as that the list of int or the container of int only had ints in it. Yeah, we took, <clears throat> we took a much different approach, obviously. <laughs> well, right. So when I started from the land of, of C or Java, you, you or C++ and Java, you get this co contravariance is an issue because you have to do this thing sort of top down front to back or whatever. And you have to know, you have to have a constraint that you can carry forward only. And when it, and when it arrives at a new place, when the covariance constraint arrives in a new place and you're not covariant, you blow up at that point, but you had to know you were covariant going into it. And the whole point of Henley Milner is that you don't have to know that he's going to sort it out. Well, we worked from a different angle entirely. We kind of started with writing the code the way we would want to see it, ah. and then worked backwards from there to build a rule system That's... that would that would support that. So, but a much different, much different desired end state. <laughs> well, right. So I started writing a syntax that I liked. And then I said, okay, now I need a theory of how this is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. And because I want to have functional programming, I have to do something with functional programming theory. And that sort of rapidly turned into, uh, I'm not, I'm not getting a correct theory. I, like I'm, I'm, I'm picking the wrong things, or I don't have the right answer for what the hell this thing means. Uh, you know, what I just wrote until I, I, came up with a theory for it. So then I went back to the theory side and I said, I got to fuck off all the syntax that I want to read. Right. And I know what I want for a typing kind of sort of, and then, you know, yeah, I'm trying to go get. Yeah. I was trying to explain in the discord, the, um, the concept of why, um, uh, why languages accept or reject the concepts of covariance and contravariance, you know, the logger, is kind of the perfect example of the contravariance and the um, extractor. I, 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 
I, I sort of like am annoyed at logger as because I'm just annoyed at logger. And I'm trying. Well, it's a, the idea being it's a consumer only. Right. It's something that does not. If you're logging a T, there's no method on it that takes a that gives you back a T. It's a it's something that consumes T but never produces it. And the, the the cool thing about that is it's type safe to do that when I, the, I think you're misunderstanding my position here. Sure, sure. Which is I don't like loggers. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I I heard that. Oh, okay. <laughs> It, but I was trying to explain, it's not that it's a logger, it's something that only consumes, right? Yes, I, I understand it only consumes. I would love to have something else that only consumes. Okay, black I, hole of I, tea. I was, I was thinking about examples the other day, because we were talking about the animal example. Yes, we just were talking about that. I, had, the cam, the I, came, I came up with, example. I think, a really good example scenario that's easy, more, more broad, and actually has a point. Fire station. So... You know, fire station has a firefighters. It has a hierarchy of captain and, you know, regular firefighters. And it has a truck. Can you drive the truck? And it has things. You, you, you even save animals from trees. So, <laughs> so we can get the animals in there. Yeah. So I was, I was thinking that. Uh, a, but you can't a, take a dog out of a tree. Is that what you're saying? Well, I don't know. It depends on your type system. <laughs> There you I go. Think, I think I think that's as, that's as much as I thought about it. More harm to object orientation than anything else. <laughs> I you know I want short, easy letters and names that are kind of clearly in some sort of hierarchy as a way to give an example, and I kind of don't care. The whole pet cat dog looked really nice in terms of eh, that's pretty clearly a cat is a pet. Well, a dog I just is want to be clear though. I didn't I didn't use the logger builder. Factory builder, factory. Well, you didn't get to the factories. Simple. That that's a different code smell. You don't have to go there. Fine. So all I said, all I came up with here is, I can in a pure lambda cal pure type lambda calculus, come up with a way to do uh, uh, subclassing and generics. And I haven't got a, a clear and obvious example of co and contravariance forcing. Although I know Henley Milner will discover the correct code contravariance by use cases. And that was my AA update. See, what's interesting to me, though, is that like you solved it specifically for lists of int and lists of string. But could you solve it for a list of some uniform type? Any uniform type. What's a uniform type? Exactly. That's what I'm asking. I don't know what a uniform type is, so I don't know what you're asking. Well, I know it's not stringing in. Okay, give me an example, maybe. I like. I don't know what you're talking about here. String is uniform. Okay, so here's a list of strings. So I solved it for at least one. Right, instance. right. But I don't want to write code to make a list of only strings. That's the benefit of a generic type. Is that okay? It's generic. So, so, so your question I... is: In AA, can you write list of unknown thing? It, it yes, but specifically backwards. that unknown. Cameron, type. Cameron, it starts backward. It starts as a generic type, and you later specify it. Yeah. Here, here, uh, Cliff uh, found a uh, clone no, no. QA way to, to parameterize it. Right. I I wrote the library code for list, which takes a generic. Yeah. Then yeah. I use list down here to make a list of string. Yeah. This is me specifying list of a string. Now, I need some syntactic sugar to take the form on the right in the comment to produce the code on the left, but it's all syntactic sugar, and I can do that under the hood in a, in the parser. Like, you'll never have to write that. You'll well, only write I, list bracket string. Yeah, the implementation of this here is equivalent to a list of uniform uniform type. I've given you a list with of the type. type. Because and now you, you can substitute whatever you want for TN. Yeah. And I to make that work, I need to have in the type system a way to type check that you have a T or you don't. And I, I don't even know care what that is or how it works. I have to know that it exists. And at typing time, it produces me, you're a T or you're not a T for every place I instantiate T. Uh, Therefore, cool, cool. you can write list of t that's what that list is and obviously that's one of those things where a nominal type system has a very easy answer 
<laughs> no, it doesn't. It has the same answer. It's just that you, you, you're you putting the work in a different place. Here I am showing you the theoretical work that goes on to a nominal type system. And the the actual parser on a nominal type system just says list of T. Inside the parser, he promptly turns around and says, you have to be a T and I have to produce this, I have to have some abstract type for T that I'm going to push forward through all situations. But exactly what list does is I have to have an abstract type for T, I'm going to call it generic as a variable. I'm going to push it forward through all the places that you don't have to see, and everywhere it'll get checked. One tricky question here would be if you want to be a TypeScript, a TypeScript here, a nominal type is equivalent to its structure. The nominal type gets dropped, and you remain all of the structure. And from there, you can go to some uncharted paths, if you will. So there is a distinction. If you, in TypeScript, uh, a T with some structure is equivalent to the some other type with a nominal structure with the same structure. Uh, the TypeScript doesn't treat them differently. So, okay. so I can do true nominal types using similar tricks. I don't have that example here right now, mm -hmm. but it's the same kind of a game. Yeah. I, I push in a forcing situation, a forcing function, or a forcing field. If you don't have that field, you're not of the nominal type. That field is purely syntactic sugar. The partial add it, you'll never have to add it. Yeah. So that's structural typing is what it's called. There, there is structural and then there's nominative. So if I want to do nominative, I'm going to be structural and also restrict you to a name. That would mean to attach it to a structural nominal tag, if you will. Yeah, and, right. And, and I can do this in the pure lambda calculus with syntactic sugar. And this is what I mean, these papers I read said, oh, it's easy. Okay, so I thought about it for a while and I think actually it's not too bad. I okay. don't have that example written, but the straightforward way to, I mean, I could go throw it up here. It'll take me a minute to hard scrabble it out in a live demo, but the straightforward answer is I will add a field with the name that you need to have. Yeah. And I'll make it a field name that's a mangled version of your actual name such that you can't actually type it accidentally so you don't have any weird shadowing problems, but the parser will just throw it in as a field. The obvious one is I'll throw in a leading space in the field name and then have, that's the mangling. As I'll take, I want to have a, a thing that's known as to be a person and it can't be a person shape, that's static structural, it has to be known, it has to be a person. Okay, I'll throw in a field that's space person as the name. You can't parse it, you can't write it, it's no accidental shadowing, the parser produces it, okay. If you, you don't have a person, it, or you could just do it idiomatically in user space and say, by the way, on all structs, if you're going to stick the word type in and then make it a string that is a static string, then it has to be that static string to be the type. Yes. If, if you can force typing with static mm -hmm. strings as the values, I'm doing the field name because the type system does field names, but the field content as a static string, all such strings are acceptable. He wouldn't say you have to have a string called Aaron, you know, you have to have a field whose final value is the string Aaron or you're the wrong type. So that, we come back back to the variance case. If you tag it to accept only a person, um, so can, it, uh, can you make it um, the variance come into place, I believe? Yeah, I believe I can make variance come into play. That one I don't have like just lying around off the top of my head and that one has to wait till I finish other bugs and decide that I want to expand the example here. So to do a, a nominative here, and I don't have a, a I'm not, not going to build an example right away. I want to have a, a, a generic has to force. So actually, here we go. Mm -hmm. So a, a list of person, <clears throat> where person has a structure is a list and a forcing function on the value, which is a person, and the person has to have a name, has to have a field name, which I'm using underscore as the mangled space. I have to have a particular field, mm -hmm. which only the parser can produce. So if you can't produce an underbar person field, you're not a person. So somewhere else in the world, I've said, I have a person which is constructed by a, you know, a, a factory for, here all types are made with factories and code. So I have to have code for the factory. So uh, uh, make a nominative. That's not the correct 
syntax, but I would do something similar like that. And I would get a person type with the structure and it, and it would be, um, it would have this magic field in it. And then later, if I want to make a list of person, if you can't have the, if you don't have the magic field, you're not a person. But if you have a hierarchy, if you come back to the Cameron Ferrer's right. example of pets and animal, here yeah. should be a pet, but how to... Right, if you... so then I make a pet object first, then I make a cat who says, the first thing that happens is I inherit from pet, and mm -hmm. therefore I get everything that pet has, including the magic pet field. So I can ask cat is an instance of pet by the verification that you have the pet field. Mm -hmm. And I can do the reverse. I have a generic pet. I can ask that you are actually a pet and not a, uh, 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 well, that's not the right answer here. If I have, I want to know that you're a cat, I would then ask specifically that you have the cat field. You would also, if you're a cat, you would also have to have the person, the pet field by yeah. construction. So, so these, this is a classic uh, tree shape class hierarchy by construction. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes sort of like you can imagine I could produce this in a library code and tuck it away. There are a few magic things I have to have. And then as soon as I have to have magic, it's not in the library, it's in the parser. Mm -hmm. So the reason I have to have magic is I have to prevent you from accidentally cheating or on purpose cheating the constructor of subtypes. So if I, you know, if I look at like what Python did or what R did, they gave you a way to build up subclassing by construction with a little care, but they didn't add any syntactic magic, which meant that you could cheat if you wanted to, and people did, and the system's not type safe. And that was, you know, that's, that was the limitation of the technology at the time. Hmm. To make it type safe, I have to make something you can't cheat, which means I have to have a parser hook. Hmm. So yeah, so I claim, yes, I can do nominative here, and it would be uh, after the syntactic sugar is swept under the rug, it would look exactly like a nominative typing system. And I can mix structural and nominative typing directly by presence or absence of picking on the name or demanding I want nominative or, or not. You know, I could demand a, a list be a nominative list so that my list field is only ever made from the capital L list. Or I could claim a list field as anybody who has a next and a value. All right. Conversational pause. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to ask any questions? Yeah, I had a question about your, uh, how you just it, at a high level, how did you get Henley Miller to deal with subtyping? Uh, exactly what I'm showing here. This is like, I am I am I am using syntactic sugar. So it, when people say subtyping, they think nominative types. Yeah. So if I wanted to do, so this example doesn't go very far. Let me, let me go, go to Cameron's most favorite example with pet and cat. Can I um, just make a small request? Something more concrete than person. Um, Which is why I know pet. Yeah. Uh, person has a lot of definitions uh, in a lot of different contexts. Use monad. Yeah. Um, no, I'm not using monad. I don't have a syntax for uh, 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 doing the extensions, which you have to have here. What I want out of this is, oh, no, no. Here. So the, ma the syntactic magic happens under make nominative and make nominative from, which I would just do make nominative from the empty set here. So make nominative says, make me a, a magic field with the name I'm handing you as a string and start with the structure I gave you already, which is either nil if I'm a root guy or it's a one of these nominative guys. It's just a structure. So under the hood, the type of capital P pet is a structure, which has a magic field. I can we get a type to get out of that. It's this. Uh, as soon as I get rid of the auto auto Google jump up here, it has a, a, a pet field whose contents I don't care about. And it has whatever other pet like things I'm, I'm throwing in. Um, and then cat will have everything that pet has as soon as I get rid of that. 
They'll also have a cat field, which I don't care about. It's just the presence or absence of the field plus cat-like and pet-like things. So I'll put a dot, a dot for the pet-like things here. So what I'm trying to get here is the making of pet gives me a type. So these are the types here. I can go write that out a little more clearly, which has a magic field. The magic on the field is simply the name is something that you can't parse accidentally or cheat by parsing. So I use a non-valid identifier uh, uh, element, a character in the name, for instance, as a mangled name. Now I've got... Uh, yes, and lives used and pet has name as a field. So we could make pet a little more concrete here and say pet has a name with a string type name colon string and, and so on. So the, the goal here is that when I say make a list and the, the forcing function on list is you have to have this magic pet string. That's the same as me saying Make a list whose elements are always instance of pet, if you will. And uh, that's my hierarchy. So, so cat has all the same things as pet does. So the instance of pet test works on cats. Any reason you have type colon rather than pet colon and cat colon? Um, type colon is my syntax. is me writing a comment that says the type is. This is just a comment to you. The type is this type. Structure with a magic field pet whose contents can be nil. I don't care what the contents are. And has another field name whose type is a string. Or I could change pet to have a type. The field contents of the type is zero, nil. Not a question mark, just zero. So that's like a upper bound for... Uh, like if I want to make a list and I say it has to have this pet field structure, that's actually kind of saying it's a subtype of pet. Yeah, it's pet or below. You're so this is below. subtyping. You're asking yeah. how to do subtyping. So exactly. you're a pet or below, where below a pet means you have all the pet fields. Specifically, you have the magic pet field. Yeah. Now only syntactically build pets with all their fields. So the magic one plus the ones that you wrote name is. Very interesting. So basically it's a structural, you know, it's inferring structure. From structure, but what you did is you put the type in the structure. Yeah. So what happens on cat if you forget to put name colon stir in? Does that you can't forget because you made cat from a pet. At some point in in the land of C, Java, and ecstasy, I said cat extends pet. That's your syntactic sugar. So here I say cat is make nominative from. How about I say extends pet? So I'm gonna replace make nominative from with extends to make it more like what you'd write in in uh, a Java or a ex ecstasy extends. Is there any way to say zero is this pointer when we look at this? Um, I, um, I don't have a this pointer directly because this is a pure lambda calculus. I can fake a this pointer and a, again, basically with syntax, and in fact, that's what AA does. He he will fake you effectively at this pointer without telling you that's what he's doing. And he, well, he, he I see pet zero, and I'm like, wait, that would be yeah. really nice to convert null into this. It's not a this. Pet is pet is a field. The underscore is a disallowed character in field names. You can't write it, but I'm going to carry it under the hood that way. So instead of underscore, you can imagine dollar sign or percent or blank, what I'm actually using is a blank, as a space. So the field name is something that you can't write, that only the parser can generate it. And that's how you can't cheat and make a mistake, like Cameron was saying, and, not, and make a, a, a cat that doesn't have pet fields. So you're not allowed to make a cat because you can't make the magic field for pet or cat. Okay, so you only get them from the constructor, which is a parser magic hack, same as cat extends pet or class pet. Exactly what I'm doing here is I'm saying class pet and I'm making a, a, a structure in the pure lambda cactus that's got this extra field in it. So maybe somebody else had a question I didn't feel like I got to the bottom of. Is that kind of making more sense now? Um, yeah, so I was going to talk about ask you about the variance then. So 
and how is it you think you can or have you thought that through yes yet? uh how do you um basically you're saying that that uh, covariance will just if it is covariant it will work uh just fall out of it or how does yeah, that... same for contra it'll it'll fall out of it and i don't have an example in hand and okay. that's because i got you know busy week for other things and okay fine so at some okay. point an example appears but not today <laughs> Right. And so, so, and, and I'm, I'm trying to talk my way through a high level concept here yeah. where I already have a container class list mm -hmm. and he has, he can be generified to list of pet. If I were to take list of pet, pick an element and say that element dot value is equal to, and I threw in something other than a pet, I mm -hmm. would get a type error. Right. If I have list of cat. And I throw in something other than a cat, I will get a type error. So if I have a function who the user wants to say takes list of pet and he assigns a cat into an element, but in runtime it's actually list of dog and he tries to turn his cat into it, I'll get a type error. Now that example I don't have lying in front of me. But I totally understand how it would work. And that's because Henley Milner would say, if I have a generic function taking list of pet and I apply it in a specific context where I have a cat list and a dog element to put in, I'll get a type error in that context. And that's part of what Henry Molnar does. That's that's and that should be a compile time error. No? And it's a yeah, it's a type error. It's a compile time error. Yeah. Yeah. You you will fail to compile. There's no there's no casting there. You'll you'll just fail to compile. I worry a little bit about cases where things stay generic basically all the way through the library and you never get that point to go from API to API and be like, hey, no, did, I need a thing that supports addition and multiplication, but actually right. all of my sizes of integer will fit in this function from one end of the library all to the other end of the library. How do I decide which size integers to use and when to start wrapping? So in the land of pure lambda calculus, integers have no size. So if you want to specialize for particular sizes, you make a specialized version for a particular size. Then if the code generator decides that list of int32, he understands that int32, he makes a 32-bit version. And if you say list of big integer, he makes a big integer version. But the pure lambda calculus, ints have no size. That's all down to the code generator or an assumption that you made that ints are always 64 bits or something. But, but pure lambda calculus, ints have no size. But I imagine you're going to have a lot of functions that match the API for integers that wrap and integers that overflow to big integers and integers that throw an exception if they overflow, which so basically it, have the same API until you actually overflow one. So I, right. So here I have picked little int to be a primitive that is a 64 bit wrapping int. But I could totally have picked little int to be an 8 bit wrapping int. And I could also use big integer everywhere. Like int's a stand in for generic integer type. I can put a generic integer type there because the lambda calculus doesn't fucking care int from int from int from int. You just say, I, I replace the word int with replace bracket T bracket. And then if I wanted to substitute in a fixed rollover 64-bit int, I can. If I want to substitute big integer in, I can. And that'll be all done at the use points where the library of list of T is used for the whole list of ints or list of big integers. So if I'm compiling an entire program yeah, and something is free all the way from beginning to end, I'm just yeah. going to get an error that says, hey... Give me a little more information so I can pin this down to an API. Yeah. No. Because it, I have it, multiple things that all have the same API. It, it, it'll turn into, right. If you if you leave somebody actually free, you'll just get an undefined variable at the end. If you declare it at some point, it'll pass through. And because the Henley Milner goes to this, this disjoint set union, it's actually really efficient. He boils the types down to something that's really tight. And then, and then you, the actual, you know, modules are basically partially typed programs. And when I take a module here and a module there and I put them together, he's just going to do a lineup of the type names and then start unifying again from the partial unification he'd done so far. Pretty quickly, you'll 
So okay. libraries can have free variables when they're done, but applications can't. Right, right. He does. Uh, Somebody's trying to do the dog cat error example. Go for it. I'm, try I'm trying to write uh, the list that would infer a pet because you put a dog and a cat in the same. Con uh, the, f the main thing here is that this is the type constructor, if you will. You cannot force it to be a dog and a cat. You, you choose here to be a cat. You okay. Can you write the list with the, the first value of the first, the head of the list is a dog uh, yeah. type, if you will. And yeah. the list is the second list with accept the cat in that okay. so, to so make the pet. Okay, so so the, the, the trick here is, am I writing for the first head of the list? Is it a generic list of object that happens to have a dog or is it a list of dog or a list mm. of pet? Which one is it? Mm. List of generic pet or dog? I would say generic. Okay. So now I have a list of generic, which I'll do with the the list itself needs to be generic list of object, if you will, okay. is made from list where the generic function does nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I have a generic list of object, and I'm going to call this head. And he happens to have a doggy, which is an instance of a dog, wherever I got that from. Okay. Now I now for the 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 next element. So this is, should be a tail element. So I have to build the list inside out. So I have to have the tail first. Okay. So now what do I do for let's call this the tail? What do I do for the head object? What is its type that you want here? I want the list of objects to become a list of pets because the dog okay. and the cat right. are extend pets. I do not uh, have a way to take a list of object and declare it a list of pet or make it a list of pet. A list of object is a list of object is a list of object. This is pure lambda calculus. All things are final, no changing types. Hmm. So it's a list of object. Now, if I want to have a concrete list of dog, that I only know about list of object, what you're really saying is the type inferencer will infer what it does. I want to tell it that I believe I have a list of object here without me really knowing if it's subtyped as a list of dog or a list of cat. And, and the infer will say, you happen to have a list of dog here, for instance, or whatever you happen to have. And you know, you say you want to, you have a list of objects that are not compatible. And then I can choose to say, if you're covariant or you're contravariance, this is an example of the explosion or whatever. But the real story here is that you wrote a type, which was not correct. You said, I have a list of object and that's not the right answer. You, you don't, you have some other kind of list and it happens to be a subclass or if you're covariant or contravariant, one of the two in the wrong way, it's, it's some portion of that. And I don't have the good example there for where you can write a type and then I'll, I'll confirm for you that you've got the variance correct. That's the harder example I was gonna wait till next week on. Right mm -hmm. here, right now, I'm happy to make a list of object or a list of dog or a list of cat and throw cats and dogs and objects in them mm -hmm. and, or pets or whatever. And then you can decide that, you know, you're making the correct kind of list or not. But what I heard you say is I wanna try and break the covariance and and the the story there is you don't get to write the type that you think it is. Hindley Miller will just tell you what that type is. Yeah, that's that's the point. The Hindley Miller will figure out the type after it's constructed, not okay. pre, a priori, not uh, uh, in the canon case. Time. It will declare. It will yeah. uh, at the construction here uh, in the ecstasy. You will declare that is a list of a list of pet list of the in top interface. That's okay, so I, we can place object with pet there if you want. That that won't. And I'll put a dog in. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to this to pet. And this the value has the has the forcing for as a pet. So now I have a list of pet. I throw a doggy in. Doggies happen to have a pet field because they're a mm -hmm. subclass of pet, right? Mm -hmm. So my tail object here is pet is. Mm -hmm. A list object containing a list of one element of a pet pet list with one element happens to be a dog. So there is a distinction between uh, like a Java array of pets. Same here, I have an array of list of pets mm -hmm. versus a list of pets that contains only dogs. So this is a list of pets that contains only dogs. Mm 
this um, this is equivalent to a type constructor. Uh, you yeah, tell yeah. it explicitly yeah, here. Yeah, close. It's it's this is an instance of test, mm -hmm. really. My my I, I don't have a type constructor. List is a type constructor, if you will. List is just a, a function that, in theory, produces or what I'm what I'm using it for is produce a thing that I can type check correctly. So effectively, mm -hmm. you can think of list as a type constructor function, mm -hmm. and it produces me an object. It produces me a constructor back which is uh, uh, specialized to making pets. No, at, the, at this point, you parameterize the list to accept pets. That's, yes, that's... right. So that would have been me in, in the land of Java saying list a uh, 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 bracket pet bracket. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. the class for list itself, I wrote above as list is, you know, of T takes a generic, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Is that we're we're getting getting there? Like I it, the the head of my list here, I can throw in a cat and and have my list of. Mm -hmm. Hey Dan, are you voting? Are you still heading for being a JC? Did I lose you already? Did you bail? Crap, it was fine. Just trying to find a mute. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, the vote is happening next week. Oh, next week. Okay, fine. All right, thanks. Thanks. Okay, where to go from here? Well, so I thought of an interesting question. Um, so is the empty list of cat equal to the empty list of pet? The empty list is only nil and has no listness to it. All right, so, so, so you're saying that if I make a there list. is no type for the empty list. Okay. Specifically and carefully, in the pure lambda calculus, if you have nothing, you have nothing. And it ain't a list of X or a list of Y. You got nothing. Hmm. All right. Yeah, people like to have empty lists of a particular type. And this particular structure won't do that. Now, I can make you one, and I would just throw on a bogus tail element that's dead or tombstone or whatever you want to call it a sentinel i that see so force. so so okay so right i wasn't i, I was kind of looking at what my language was doing so so in your so what but i'm looking at this so you have to specify the generic type every time you append two elements right no well like how do you make a list of three elements so i'm making the list here with in line the the hard way because I don't have any syntactic sugar that says square bracket you know cat dog horse um that's a syntactic sugar expansion under the hood it's going to say I made a new cat I made a new dog I made a new horse I made a no, collection no, no, okay. I jammed them in but like I mean it, you're calling it a list but like how do I make a list with three elements like if I want zero one two three how do I yeah do okay that? fine so I want a list of three elements. So here's a here's a list int. There's the constructor for a list element member who I need syntactic sugar for. That's the inside. I'm going to wrap it with a list. Oops. I can't type today. List int of a two. And then, you know, list int of a what? Three. Whoops, three. Done. There's a list of three elements. Do I like this? No. Do I want to write this? No. Is it syntactic sugar? Yes. I can totally auto expand it okay. under the hood and the parser. Okay. But, but well, the question is like, what if you don't use the same list in all the, like, like what if yeah. you have like a list int 32 and like, it, don't do, list in don't 64 do, and you mix on, them don't, in the list. Alan, don't do ints of different sizes. Go specifically to things that are blatantly unrelated, so it's more clear. So the middle guy make him a list of string. All right. And then change the two to like ABC. You know, make a string out of the two. Otherwise, that list of string is being passed an int, and he'll blow up and say, "I'm not going to make a list entry of a string." And the you know, list is really a list entry. Okay, now this one will blow up because up above you, where I say ignore one, not ignore zero, ignore one. I will confirm. That the, that the first element of a list and the second element of a list, the next element of a list have the same type. They do not, you'll get a type error. Hmm. 
Okay. So you're saying each, oh, so each element of the list verifies the whole list when you can verifies it. the next element okay. only, which via induction gets the rest of the list. Well, he just checks the next element. I mean, I'm looking at this though, and like, you know, I, I don't know which version of list we're using, but I'll assume it's the yeah. last one. It's like list bracket. E. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. And it calls it calls generic on Val. Which... Okay, that's the type checker, and he ignores the result. He just wants to know that he doesn't have a type error for calling right, generic. Right, right, but that will succeed. But it's it's not calling the the same generic. It's calling the list generic. So like, it looks like the list of. I mean, so it'll call, it'll call the string generic on the string, and it'll right. call it yeah, he's right. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so so this needs to be generic of list. A yeah. like this. Okay. I right. will say that each generic. list is a tuple. It contains a pointer to the data and a pointer to the address of the potentially tail of the list. Yes. And so the cutter is that... of type yeah. string and the car is of type list of string. Hmm. And, and he knows he, he checks that he has. So I'm, I'm not checking that you're all nominatively a list in this example just that everything has a next field or a list field and everything has a vowel field and they have other fields that I don't care. And that the generic is the test of the vowels all have, the, they all pass the generic test. To make a longer list or a shorter list, you have to have already confirmed the shorter list is correct. So when the longer list shows up, when you append the head of the list, he just checks the first element of the tail, knowing that the tail inductively has the same test passed already. So it's not an n squared mm -hmm. test. It's a it's a constant time okay. test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It still seems suspicious. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> well, okay. So I claim that you should be able to put this into, for instance, Scala or uh, uh, ML or Haskell as a direct syntactic shuffle. I mean, I'm not using the right syntax, but just a straight up syntactic shuffle. And he should confirm or deny everything as you would expect. Like I, this is pure Lambda calculus, no tricks. So it should totally work on anyone else who does a type Lambda calculus. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so well, I mean, I just think like it's it's very suspicious that the type is associated with each element rather than being yes. like a field that's okay. like so, separate from right uh, so, so back up a section second here if i was to look at a, a, a map the java map interface there's an entry which has a k and a v and every element in the kv set has a, 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 is effectively got a type right and they all have to have the same type they all have to be you know map of key has two but the keys have to be the same type to be a valid Java mm -hmm. list or set. Yeah, or whatever but like if we're function. actually talking about the types, they all get erased and it's all object. <laughs> so like Yeah, right. So so Java's unsafe because they got erased. They throw in runtime tests. And here we're doing it step by step. And I am throwing in a function to declare the type of each node and list. Okay. That's because I want my list to be. Uh, 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 have the same throughout the whole length. Now, having said that, I'm throwing it in at every entry in the list. In an actual implementation, the, the generic would not take any space. I would end up with a effectively a prototype or a class for the list specialized to the particular T you're looking at, and generic would be there as an instance of test for T. So there's no cost efficiency issues here. I have a linked list with a next and a val field. And I have a separate type for each uh, uh, subtype, for each list that you instantiated to an actual type, I have a separate class for that. So if you say list of bracket string and list of bracket int 32 and list of bracket pet, I got three classes right there on top of the okay. list one. I, okay, I realized what I don't like about this is that you're storing this generic function pointer for each element. And so that's like another pointer of overhead. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, a, it's a purely type theoretical crutch in an actual implementation because it's a final field of a constant value, a function. I don't need to put it in every element. I put it in the prototype for the element. 
and that that gets it out of every element. Okay, and like the one thing I want to add is like, um, you know, I want to say that like the 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 gen the function that you're using to to make it equal for one part of the list is the same as the part of the next. I want to say like ignore two equals you know generic equals list dot generic. I can't type. Yes, the same problem I have. Uh, right. And you just spelled the first generic and it cat auto capitalized on you and blah blah blah. Yeah, yeah. right, fine. And yeah, if yeah. you fail that you're a type error. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, and I'm... that's the syntactic sugar piece that I that I need an instance of test for. But I could uh I I, I should enforce that as well. You're correct. Yeah. So so now, with that you with that you could have two lists of end and and you want to separate oh you want to differentiate them, right? I mean, make sure that you understand that those are like two different types. Um, what I would probably do is put a, a a list container head and list element numbers, and the container head would have generic mentioned exactly once, and would confirm every subpart has the passes the generic test. But then the word generic actually physically appears only once in the type. So there's a there's a more tidier version of this where I don't put generic on every entry. Hmm. Right. I need a type assertion there that those are equal, which is an obnoxiously difficult to do in a type system in the coding, but I can, it's just a little more difficult. If you uh, lose this, then you have an H list. I wrote the scalar example here. And this allows you to, on each construction uh, of the section of the list to put a new type. And this is fine. This is fine to the to a scala rule. If you don't if you don't do this, then each construction of the list ca can have its own type. I um, think as long to as, scroll down a bit. As long as the generic of one guy both passes his own value and passes the next guy. Because mm -hmm. the ignore one says you pass the next guy. So because the critical part here is that generic is a function on each invocation. On each invocation, have to pass the generic. If I'm using the list constructor, I only get the one generic because that was done on making like list of int and list of string has the one generic function. So using list int list string will never get you the problem where the generic field tests and, and the ignore two is not necessary there. If you instead say I have a list like thing, but I'm not using list int or list string as a constructor, oh, maybe I don't need it now because in fact it's a hidden internal function. I don't think I need ignore two. You can't change that hmm. because it's only built from the constructor. No, it's not necessary to do ignore two. I'm going to comment you out and say not necessary. Well, like, I mean, in that case, I mean, if it's not necessary, then like, what? Why? I'm trying to figure out why the fun How do you know the function pointers are equal? If you because they only come from the generic identifier at, from the top of the list constructor. You cannot make a list object using the capital list I give you here, where the generic guy varies from element to element. It is not possible. Well. I you mean, can make a thing which is not a list a where it does vary from, but it looks like a list, but it's not a list. And it does vary from element to element, but that's not a list. That's a thing you've made up. That's that's a cool looking random thing, but it's not a list. Using capital list given here, the only thing I have is a function which takes a generic argument. I call it once, I get back another function. And generic is in the closure in the inner function. So list int has generic hidden inside of it. And you can't reach it, read it, write it, modify it. You can't use a different one. So if you use list ints, you only get ints that have the generic for the int in it. And if you use list string, same there. You cannot make a different generic. Well, I mean, I, I think, I don't know. I mean, it depends on what your type system looks like, I guess. No, classic have... Henley Milner. No, 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 nothing special. Literally classic yeah. Henley so, Milner. So you don't have subtyping. So I guess you're. No subtyping. Are... That's correct. Yeah. Classic Henley Milner. So you're probably all right. Like, <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I claim I am trying to fake subtyping. I think I've got it. 
from Classic Hanley Milner, but I just got Classic Hanley Milner. Well, you say that, and then you have like all these recursive types and infinite types. And... But I'm not using them in this example. Yeah. This example is, that's what I'm saying. This example should cut and paste into Haskell with slight modification to the syntax. Mm -hmm. I don't happen to have a Haskell lying around, but it's it, it does nothing that Haskell wouldn't do. So my question is, why do you have the constructor structure that you have rather than just using the at braces? It um, feels like types are just collections of constraints. So what I'm doing here is... And the thing yes. that I highlighted, I could totally be like, hey, a pet is a struct that has underscore pet equals zero and some set of fields. Right. And a cat is just a struct that has everything that the pet requires in the type plus some more stuff. That's correct. That's that's and how And this it feels equivalent to what you were doing. That's it... how it types, but that's not a pure lambda calculus. So AA has this syntax going on inside of it. So when I have syntactic sugar, I'm and I'm doing a pure lambda calculus because I want to see how it works. How the typing flows in a pure lambda calculus for which the theory is very well understood and very strong. Now I'm going to write pets and cats and classes and extends in a convenient format in AA, but I want to know that under the hood, that's just syntactic sugar for this piece of pure lambda calculus, which types exactly how you understand it with, with strong theoretical bounds or strong theoretical understanding. So would, would that part like that part uh break your assumption so you you create a list of pat yeah. uh, with doc you create a list of pat with the doc and the cat and then you say i want a list of cat because and that would actually work because your your next element would be a cat right i'm trying to think it might can you go the reverse um, Maybe I just these, broke no, all your theory no, no, right here. Of, no, no. List of cat would claim that the following list was not a list of cats, and he would blow you up. You can why, go why the other way. And why why would it do that? Your generic test checks the next element, and that is a cat, right? It, the generic check tests that the element... So that, the, so that will... So it will, you would add cat2, and it would check cat... And cat would be a valid object for a list of cat. It would not check down. No, no um, right. Hang on. Let me let me think through for a second here. Like like the doggy is not necessary for the moment, but you wanted to make a li mixed list. You want to know that the generic test tests that your cat in the next guy, and the next guy. Oh yeah, we checked the cat field. The next guy and the next guy was definitely held a cat element. Right. I would have to confirm that the generic. And, and you would probably pet. not go. You would probably not go down all all of the. No, no. Uh, the goal is to not go down all of them. Right. There right, you go. Right. There, there, there's your breaker. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> I might have to do the generic test. I might have to bring it, bring back the ignore two. Right. I, I just wanted to say probably the ignore two will will be the solution to that. Yeah. Um. If I go the other way, Pet would ask is a list of cat. Oh, but that's widening and that's okay anyhow. Right. Yeah, I the, think the you're problem right. is that the, the, the problem is that you have the uh, wrong type further down the stack. Now ignore two test above. Okay. Um so I will I will Ponder. Okay. Yeah, that looks like a, a valid counter. So maybe I do need it, Alan. Fine. Well, uh, you, you said you're running out of edge cases. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I mean, fine. like the the type you have you now is like the type I came up with with us playing around. So I think it's right. I mean, basically, you have a. I mean, the way I ever phrased it 
is you have an untyped list and then you have like a type a type in a pair or to a record or whatever and the type says the type of L of the elements so the 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 goal here would be to have the empty list have a type and that you enforce yeah it. and so that's the only question is like yeah. does the empty list have a type and like yeah. you know the way you did it like it the the null element doesn't have a type because yeah. it's not it's it, it's not no. part of its like generic yeah. framework yeah it's, it's actually not so, so there's no type on it yeah 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 so so, so there's another version of a list where i have a uh and a container for the list and i have elements inside the container and the container has the generic test and then this problem all goes away right and there nil does have a type and so that's like the empty list has a type right yeah not nil the empty list well well nil is like and it's it not is, nil is not the name for uh, an empty list no it's not <laughs> nil is nil is nil is nil, is nil is not a name for an empty list in in my language, in in the in the pure type syntax here, it is not anything. Okay. There's okay. nothing going on with no. It's it's just another. N never never claim there's no language that does that. There's always JavaScript. I'm not claiming there's no language that does it. <laughs> AA doesn't do that. Pure yeah. Lambda calculus doesn't do that. Uh, syntactic sugar wrapped from JavaScript to whatever they do for functional programming might do something. I don't know. Uh, da, 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 Yes, I think your counter is a valid counter here, because I know the next element is a cat, but I don't know the next test test for specifically cat, because it could be. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. just. Yep. I'm I'm just trying to come up with something that could actually break the ignore too, because I think if you if you might have like well, two it, inheritance levels. You could you could actually break the second uh, the ignore two assumption as well. If I have what? If you if you have one more well fake subclassing level. I would say it has to be fake fake subclassing. So so I'm I'm come around to I need a different version of a list. Um, one that has uh, a, a container, a head a head of a container, and then one that has members in it, which is what the Java linked list does right. actually. There's an entry elements inside and there's a container on the top. So I want a container which would be called list and it would have the generic test and it would have members whose values all pass the generic test from the outer wrapping container. And you could have an empty list there as well if you wanted to, but it would keep the type and the, the test in the container. So there's another version which, which has a more precise testing that I don't have here then. If you allow, if you reach type parameters, this would be easily available by this T here, and this should be this T here. And all right, but yeah, don't don't put them in the example as written because that's informative as it is as to where the yeah. error comes from. Thinking, mm -hmm. um, okay. the but the the type parameters exactly what I'm trying to do is build type parameters. So I cannot assume type parameters to build them. But you, I think it's uh, tricky here to use the generic call because you can call on each invocation of the list. You can call a different generic. You no, can you can't. That was the, that was the point. No, you cannot. Mm. It, okay, so look at look at list of int in the middle of the screen here. The generic has been set. Hand, given a list int object, oh. when I say list int, handed me a list int. I cannot is... get at the generic field. It is not an exported API out of List this is a type constructor. This is the. Yeah, this... I'm, I'm trying to fake a type constructor for list yeah. int. The mm -hmm. list int hides generic inside of it in the closure. Mm -hmm. It is not an exported API. That's. It returns that's... me a function, has two arguments. I cannot see the generic field. I cannot write it, read it, test it, mangle it. I cannot that's clone it. To construct the two lists uh, inside the list inside of another list and put a different type in it. This so, is what uh, uh, Chris was doing was to make list int and list string and, and make them subclasses. So list int string won't do it, but list cat and list pet will. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I was failing to distinguish between list of cat and list of pet correctly. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a you could narrow a pet list to a cat list incorrectly. Mm -hmm. And that was requiring the other, the other test there, which I can't do in types with an assert. That's not a type. I don't have a type failure. 
uh, uh, for an unequals on a runtime value. I have to have a type failure, which I can short out a different way, but that's, I'd rather go to the head of the list and the, the body as list if elements. You, if you can construct a list uh, with the head being a dog and the tail being a cat, if, if you didn't construct it a prior to be a pet, then somehow the Hindley Miller have to unify a dog and a cat and conclude that it's only thing it should be. The, right. So if I if I go to the original list at the head of the world, at the head of the example page here, that is a list of objects. It has no constraints. Oh. It'll tell you that the value field is the unification of, of cats and dogs, which with my subtyping game being played here, which gets you effectively a pet. Ah. Oh. Uh, oh. I am not going to test that with a 10 foot ball. Oh. So oh, here, here it's easy because you are guarding the type constructor. You you explicitly yeah. construct it to be a specific type. Yeah, I, I I construct it such that values have to pass the are you an integer test. So at this point, it's it's on. You can only have a list of integers here. You can only ha you can only have integers here. It can right. at this point the type theory it's solid because right the the bug comes if I have the generic test is unable to verify the rest of the list mm -hmm. because he only passes the next test and that's not sufficient to cover the rest of the list. Which which is great for anything not, sub, not subclassed. Which is, yeah, works for things that are not subclassed, right? That will fail on subclasses. Yeah, yeah. So there is another version of this which can be written down below here, which I'll maybe go to code block to. Um, and, and attempt to do something there, but maybe I yeah, shouldn't do it live. We should carry on and okay. well, do whatever we're gonna do here. Enough type theory, where to go next? So I'm throwing out in case we wanna change topics here. Yeah, it was an hour and a half of type theory. So there you go. So I do an AA yeah. update, it takes an hour and a half of type theories. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, not related to types, which is, so uh, what do you people want for inline, like to, like uh, as a performance optimization, what would you want in your language uh, to to allow you to do, uh, if needed, uh, to for force inlining? In yes. But for example, and I'll give you the the reason I'm asking is that the Scala three has it allows me to say that this def this method should always be inlined every time it's used, no matter what. Yeah. But I can't say this particular you know nothing about that def, nothing about that method. And then say in this particular spot where I'm calling it, please inline it. It seems to me like it'd be more useful for optimization. Like if I need, so that's, that's what I was curious. Like uh, what do people want? What do people really want? Well, this is one of those things where like the inline keyword from the land of C is kind of, you know, in the land of Java profiling covers you in the correct set of cases. I agree that the calls on the inline it is what you want. So exactly what you just described. I don't actually think it's that useful to have inlining on the definition side. I'm not actually sure if you need this in the language at all today. Because if it's something like getter and setter, it's trivial for the compiler to analyze. And any, I mean, undergrad writing a compiler inlining heuristic will pick this up that this is a small function and that it's inlineable. So I don't think you ever need to have inline at the definition side in your language. But call side, actually, this may be non-trivial. And this may be something that the programmer may need to see. Okay, so the JVM, now... you can remove dispatch by inlining a particular usage. Uh, okay, wait, exactly. What if the dispatch is non-trivial? And you said inline me, and the dispatch is a megamorphic fu function call. Well, then you inline the megamorphic logic plus the test for each of the options. So what, what happens then is that you you give the programmer you know rope to hang themselves because as soon as you do that, you'll blow out your iCache and your performance will go to the toilet. So, so if it's if strongly it's, typed, you remove the megamorphic. Um, yeah, so variant. if you remove the megamorphic, the compiler can inline and he'll do so if it's hot already and, and you're done. If you're if you're megamorphic, your inlining is really dangerous for performance up until. I don't know the Scala inline syntax, but that's what the reified keyword is in uh, Kotlin. Right, because right. there's two levels of objective. On the one hand, there's the where do I want to put the inline keyword, but the true answer is 
nowhere. I never want to tell the compiler where to inline. I want the compiler to tell me, I've been measuring your stack. Here's where you should and shouldn't inline. Well, but that, that will only work for the JIT compilers. If you have a ahead of time compiler, you yeah. may not be so... Yeah, you may not be able to that easily. The, the... Right, and it and it, it, it depends, right? If you're if you're looking at microcontrollers where you really have like a very limited stack size, uh, you sometimes really make want to make sure that you're staying in the same stack tra uh, stack frame and and not uh, going to have another function call. So most of these things for static languages have good static heuristics now because this is an old problem in both directions, both size and speed for a long time. It is rare that you actually blow out the compiler's static heuristic. Whereas in Kotlin, I'd much more be willing to believe that you are megamorphic without realizing it. And you want somehow to tell the compiler that it's not megamorphic when it actually is, and then come around and say, not that I want to inline here per se, but I want to go to the surrounding loop and make a version of the loop that is specialized for the individual uh, uh, make them over choices. Of course, if, if you no, reify you... the base class, you're paying the price. But if you reify the special case, yeah, what do you mean uh, by reify? Inline, what do you mean by reify? Uh, don't don't okay, use the word so reify. Inline uh, T fun gives you an inline function with the megamorphic overhead. Inline reified T uh, fun gives you an inline with a flattened uh, T that is no longer generic type eraser and uh, virtual um, so, so in back, theory. Right, so back up. So you keep saying reified. I keep saying, don't say reified because I don't know what you mean by it. It's uh, it's the same as uh, extends, but reified means to flatten, uh, to inline that class uh, type. Okay, inlining, uh, don't if do inlining on types generic. because types don't inline. Okay, so it removes the generic component from that parameter. So uh, it sounds it, like a, that sounds like a monomorphization. Mon you know, some say, are you, are you doing type I'll go with that. or yeah, monomorphization? You make a class that is specifically the generic for list of generic and but that, now becomes list. That sounds sounds awful a lot of the Scala specialization because and we all know the problems there, the the blow up of the special it, the special yeah. specialized right. types yeah. for a particular that's a seven I tried that for a while and I got really bad answers out of that one. That was terrible. <laughs> There's a way to do it, maybe, but I couldn't make it happen. But it's a Jim's question is something different yet. Still, I'm hearing I got a a I want to teach the compiler at typing time that there's a constant type here. Like the JIT compiler, if you happen to be using a constant type that you could reify by some short syntax, almost surely the JIT compiler has already also figured out that you have a constant type here. Because that's I mean, that's what he does. No. I think uh, the, um, the so this goes thing. in and inserts a static function um, apart where, from where are you writing an example because I haven't seen it in the docs am I looking at the place? I might have put something in discord a while ago but oh um, you're doing it in discord that's why I'm not no no a while ago um, oh. but, okay so I don't have an example I'm not uh, oh, okay. open in the doc yet Okay, I thought you were going to throw something in the docs because what I what I'm so far what I'm hearing is I want to have some syntax I want to write that tells tells the typing system that I have some sort of way that the generic type becomes specialized and that with a theory that the JIT will then inline because he has a static call and if you have at runtime a well understood single target that you call all over the play, or you call repeatedly in a hot loop, typically the JIT picks it up via profiling and does a type check, which is one clock, which he'll move outside of your loop. And then he'll call your loop with the known type, which he'll then inline. And you'll get the good answer already without further ado. And there may be confusing factors going on in Kotlin that I don't understand that break this. But a, a thing the JIT very specifically will profile is, I've got a call in a loop. What are the set of receiver objects? If it's the same class receiver object, when I come through the generate code for that loop, 
I'll put a test in the body of the loop that says, if you're this, oh, it's hot inline, else bail out. And then I'll look at that and I'll say, can I declare you loop invariant? If so, I'll test beforehand and then you'll just be no test in the body of the loop even. And that is a known thing specifically put in, especially for directed byte buffer, heat byte buffer. <clears throat> So, uh, Cliff, you had uh, earlier mentioned that sometimes it just doesn't get it right. Like if there's more than two, it just gives up. There's and... there's a limit of what um, he'll do because the profit metric usually loses. You you go slower if you start yeah. to inline more and more. So that, that was the example you gave of like a situation where you want to be able to tell the compiler really do the inlining here, even though there's 30 of them, because this is. Uh, yeah, I... Usually that's a loser. Like, like, like I want to do a different thing. And, and for H2O, I did a different thing. So. so if you inline 30, you probably lost because you're doing a type test for 30 things followed by bulk of code for 30. Mm -hmm. It's only possibly a marginal win if you rapidly rotate between 30 things. If instead you loop over one guy and then the next time you take the same loop, you loop a different guy. The next type you same loop, you loop a different guy. But each time you're running a loop, it's with one dude. Right, right, right. You pull it out. That was, I think you mentioned that too. You, you want, want to do loop on switching. You need to pull the type test out of the loop. Yep, yep. To do that, because it varies, you have to do loop. That was your, that was your, yeah. your example of the JIT compiler wouldn't figure that out. So you want to be able, you want your language to allow you to say that somehow. No, no, it's, he, he'll That's figure it out if it's the value that you're testing for is loop invariant. It's virtual, it's megamorphic, but on this particular iteration of the loop, it's only happening to the same target. That one he'll figure out. Okay. If it's megamorphic, and he can't tell that it's loop invariant, and you happen to know that it's loop invariant, then you can arrange a version that you want to have a clone of the body where I say it's all always this type in this loop body, and always that type in that loop body. And I have to test because I can't prove the compiler, so type safety, I have to check it at runtime. But that's only one clock. Yeah. And I have a customized body that has the inline for the one. Don't I, do I need inline for that? Can I just write that? Like test this? That one you that. can't, you have, must write at the current state of the world because it's not it's not the same thing as an inline keyword. It's a take this loop and clone it once for every type. Right. I mean, I could do that in my code. I don't need it. You could do it in your code, which is what I did in H2O. I cloned it for every type. Yes. So, okay. So then then, then, then do you want inline? Do you want a way to, to tell the compiler of a language you're using? Where inline something where uh, I want to tell him to go out the loop. Here's a here's a call site which is megamorphic from the compiler's point of view. Here is a loop surrounding the call site. I want to tell the compiler it is valuable that this will not change from the body of the loop. Okay. Despite the fact I don't know what type it is, it's megamorphic, and I can't infer that it won't change because the type comes say from the body of an array. You gave me an array of pets. It happens to be full of cats. You know, will only be full of cats. You want right. the compiler to optimize for the case where today it's full of cats, tomorrow it's full of dogs. Right. And so you want him to do that case. It's not a thing he'll normally do. You had that to bring a case that. where he, you say, look at the first element. That's yeah. the element for the entire loop iteration. Okay. Dispatch on that first element to a customized version that is cats only. And you have to check every element that they're a cat. That's only one clock. I'll blend it in with all the other code. And, and then I've inlined your cat and all the virtual calls, they're all cat calls now, and they're all statically inline. They disappear. Okay. Right. That's that's that the thing. That, that's interesting. But that doesn't sound like even inline to me. That almost sounds like uh, no. You know, if, cast, you know, if it's a list of cat, you could. It's not a list of. It's a oh. list of, given to me as a list of pet or a list yeah, of exactly. Object. But you know, it's a list of cat or a list. You know, or, it's a list uh, of a single type. Single type. Yes, that's yes. What you, you don't know what type. But you don't know but, what type right, it yeah. is. Yes. The, the distinction with Kotlin is that you can specify that T is a cat um, when you reify it. Okay. Um, and that, then it that will has be specialized. Run time. So that's a cast. That's a runtime test that you're a cat. Sure. It's in line that the call side. So it's already statically known. I'm I mean, I think that's the main motivation. Yeah, well, okay, for... I'm missing, I need a more concrete example because I'm missing how yeah. if I put in the word cat in my text around a type, I don't need a, a, a test right then and there in the runtime that you're a cat. I, I think the uh, the motivation for the for the whole thing is that you have um, 
uh, megamorphic calls. You have the limitation of hotspots that it's not a trace based JIT, but a method based yeah. JIT. Right. So uh, whatever profile you have for your method, it gets polluted because it it gets called from different places and uh, the thing Kotlin is doing is uh, is basically with this inline refight it takes this piece of code this piece of bytecode and slots it into the call side so that we are basically we are separating it's, out uh, it's inlining from, already at from the from the yeah. shared method that would be Does called it, from this is the check right. for the type for the Sorry? What this... I heard you say was you're inlining at the bytecode level. Kotlin transpiler from Kotlin to bytecodes inlines at the bytecode level. It is about as close as a macro as JVM sees. Okay. And this is what, what same thing I was just talking about with Bill that I do in, in H2O, that I clone code at a higher level to break the megamorphicism. And I have a concrete instance with a concrete type for each of the different choices. So yes. That is a that is a place to do inlining on. I mean to do a to an annotation on because that requires large bulk code manipulation or duplication in order to get precise timing or precise types inside each of the bulk pieces. So I took my my big loop and I made clones of it, once for pets and once for cats and once for dogs and once for heat byte buffer and one for direct byte buffer and or whatever. I took took that loop and cloned the whole loop. Yeah. I, I mean uh one fix for that that would make this um, workaround unnecessary would be to have a, a, a trace based JIT because these are usually pretty good at separating the different call sites with different types. And I also expect it's not it's with, not uh, trace based or not. It's not an either or. This the C one compiler yeah. or the or the cut down C two needs to recognize this and inline ahead of time and then you'll pick it up the same way. The, yeah, the, exactly. the the sort of story is you you the first tier compiler wants to be quick and cheap and easy and if he has a hot loop he'll do whatever inlining makes sense but it's megamorphic but if he has a hot loop and he ends up with megamorphic in the hot loop he needs to clone out a, an outer layer and go again with more inlining to get the, sharper types for the next layer up does that's, it always go the for the cloning does it uh, go always for the cloning of the loop? Can it just uh, put the test if the first test is the always the most the most known type you called with your code? It, so th there's sort of three cases here. There's and there's all start. Does you have a hot loop or you don't care? Mm -hmm. so you got a hot loop. Mm -hmm. The body of the loop has a megamorphic megamorphic function call. Okay, mm -hmm. it's either truly megamorphic on every iteration, in which case. Inlining is probably a loser over taking your, your 30 clocks to do the V call because of iCache blowout issues. Okay, mm -hmm. that's one situation. Another one is it's statically the same, but it varies from whole loop iteration. So the whole iteration of a million, it's always the same class, but the class comes from the members and I can't tell it that they're all the same. This is a case where I have typed it as an array of pet and it's full of cats, but I don't know that it's all cats because it's not in the typing system. Right. In that case, I test every iteration and it happens to be the same over the entire body of the loop, but a <coughs> compiler doesn't know that ahead of time. And the next version is I have the hot loop, I have a V call. The V call comes from a loop invariant of value, and I can test the V call ahead of the loop. And if I test it ahead of the loop, then I can specialize the loop without the test in it whatsoever. If I uh, test it in the body of the loop and say profiling tells me that it's usually heat byte buffer, then I got a is heat byte buffer is one clock, and here's the inline body of heat byte buffer in the body of the loop, and it's pretty good. <laughs> and a little bit better is move that test out, and I don't have a fail in the test, and it's just heat byte buffer in here. But if this one fails, I have to go to the direct byte buffer over here and clone the whole loop again. That's probably what I do in, in all of these cases. I don't know if that's cases. what you just said, but uh, right. Kotlin Native has a feature to pass in the type uh, as a memento, an instance, and then uh, reify that type yeah. um, right. and inline, of yeah. course. Okay, um, so that's that's a valid, useful case. So Hotspot doesn't do that. H2O, I did it by hand. Uh, I know how to do it automatically, but it would help to have a hint. I know how to do it with profiling, but it requires your more aggressive rounds of profiling. 
which you know hotspot could do if it wanted to and if they get around to it maybe but it feels like eventually you're going to land in profiling a lot of the things i've seen like that are oh it's megamorphic and there's 16 things that could be here except the most popular one is the 90 percent case yeah and the second one is nine percent yeah and out, the third one is essentially the last percent, and right. the everything past three okay. doesn't happen except in that's, times when you do need a stack trace anyway. So that's the, the good matter. case where you have this distribution, and then you could just inline the hot and do an else virtual call, the rest, and you don't care. There is another case that says they're all equally, it's all equally the same, but it's hot for this, then it's hot for that, then it's hot for the other guy. Now I want to clone the whole loop body once for each of these guys. That one I want more profiling to determine. That's a case where the first tier compiler, the guy who does the profiling, ends up with a hot loop with a megamorphic call. He needs to flag that I got a hot loop with a megamorphic call. I need to rerun where I clone the hot loop. So I go up one layer of a function body is usually how you would do it and compile up here with a fixed type for when I call into the next layer down and bail out or profile or whatever, and you get different profiles for each of the pieces parts. How will that react if you have a giant hot loop that only gets called once? If you only got called once, then there, there's nothing to be done about it. This is the same occasionally thing as- Because I've seen data replacement. processing cases where it's like, yeah, load in the data, yeah. process the data, yeah. exit. Yeah, so you that, only call the, the loop once, but also right. you call the loop, you go through the loop billions yeah. of times. Yeah, like yeah, you that really goes, do want to optimize that, even though on you only ever basement. call it once. This is the, the what I call the micro benchmark problem, uh, the on oh. stack replacement problem. The guy says, oh, I want to see how fast the compiler is. So I'm going to say for I equals one to a billion, do Zors on a hot loop. It does nothing, right? So I'll jit the code and decide that it's, you know, does nothing exciting. And the next time you call main, you'll get it. And of course, you never call main again, right? So so that's the on-stack replacement problem. And I do a reasonable thing there of where I, I jump you in the middle of the loop with the, ex the generated code jumps in the middle of the loop. But he does takes the profiling he's got so far. So you profile for a while your giant loop, and then in the interpreter, and then you do C1, who has to jump in the middle of the loop, and he profiles it, and then you go to C2, and he profiles it. So you don't get the loop invariant version because you're never calling it loop again. Instead, you might get the version where it's hot, the 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 V calls hot on a particular guy. Uh, the profile is very skewed, and then I'll I will do the inlining of the skewed profile that I've seen so far. And then you'll break if you have great, you'll get performance break, you get bad performance. If it happens to be the case that you only call the loop once, the loop runs a million times on cats and then a million times on dogs and a million times on horses. And he'll profile for cats and optimize for cats. And then when the loop contents rotate from cats to dogs, he'll fail the dog test all the time. And you'll get the bad answer after that. And that's just that the trace guys won't do any better. That this is the same problem for them. I I'd say the difference uh, is that uh, with um, a trace based JIT, you basically uh, it's uh, you're saving the first round of inlining to figure out uh, what to do. Um, I having like stared a... hard at trace based and not the trace based for many years, as everyone's saying, "Hey, this is better than that," and whatever. That answer comes back around that. They're really close if you put a lot of engineering on both. So far, Hotspot is modestly ahead of all the tracing guys, like 30%. But, uh, but, uh, but I think Hotspot has uh, spent a disproportionate amount Compared of to V8? Method, uh, yeah, I was going to say, with the exception based, of V8, uh, it's the most invested in VM in the world. Yeah, right, except uh, V8. And it's... You know, within this JavaScript versus Java, never mind. It's it's not you know. Uh, I think the the performance difference between V8 and Hotspot is not is not uh, based on the uh, on method versus trace. Uh, uh, there are plenty of tracing jits for Java that Hotspot whipped up on, and it had and and the investment you're talking yeah, about they, was not they, necessarily they all... it nothing to do with the tracing because I looked hard at this and all these guys were doing the same kind of thing. I... And yeah, then everyone I... was saying, "Why don't you do tracing?" And the answer was always, "You miss so much context that the trace." Code itself sucked. He said, no, I had more. No, I always had less context. They, they thought they had more and they had less. It, they missed all kinds of type invariants and they had to put tests in to regather them all. So they gathered them all with tests. And that was where all the time went, was rebuilding up of the invariants that I got because I had a 
a type system handed to me by the language spec that gave me stronger guarantees up front about what the types of everything was. The chasing that guys had to all reinvent those types that I got out of the type system. So I didn't need the tests. So uh, the hotspot with uh, specialized generics will be slower than, than the erase generics. Cause I, that, that is not that true. Approach. It has nothing to do with nothing. The, those are like unrelated. Oh, like a hotspot I mean the, that that's... has no optimizations put on like different coding styles that have shown in the last 20 years will always be worse than a hotspot that is actively worked on the coding styles that have shown in the last 20 years. And that would be true for a tracing jet as well. So these are all like where you put your engineering dollars and who does the, the tracing has no generic advantage over a method jet. It has none. People keep saying that and I keep looking at it and, 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 and never. Is, uh, I mean, is there any uh, comparable example of this? I mean, of course we can put out, uh, we can show hotspot, which basically received uh, 10 times investment of any other comparable VM. And uh, I think um, uh, okay. Not, I, you know, I, all I can say is, back comparison. in the day when it had not yet gotten those kind of investments, the tracing guys were not doing anything that I wasn't already also doing. Except I always ended up with better, you know, better numbers and better types. And it seems pretty clear it was all in the in the dispatch going around and the type checks going around on the tracing guys. I, you know, I, I stared hard and I had so many people telling me to go do it this way versus that way. And in hindsight, looking backward, I, I, may, I think I made the right call. I feel like the argument I've usually heard for the tracing JITs was that you didn't need to have as deep understanding of the type systems or behavior of the languages. Maybe. I, I and the found the idea was that, that they were easier to write if you had a small was... team of people and you didn't have time to exactly. really think yeah. hard about what were all of the invariants of the language that you are compiling? Uh, that one I've also heard, and I believe it's easier to get a good number out. I, I didn't, it didn't seem to me to be any harder to get the one out of that I got. That is the extra type info and understanding the extra type info and the taking advantage of it was not in my head any harder once I started that way, but I didn't run the tracing JIT path directly in my early days i did modest small tracing jets that were very simple on very simple languages uh but once i got to sun i just did the method jet because that's kind of where i started from and that's where people had started from and that's a good answer so i did that and then also sun knew which languages it cared about yeah yeah at that like time the jvm about, yes. they wanted to run java and jruby right. and scala and no, no. Closure. like the yeah, top the five languages on the jvm is most of jvm usage Th those uh, came much later. At the time that Hotspot was designed and the choice of method or trace was made, it was just Java. Yeah. The goal I was to be competitive that, yeah. with C to get Microsoft and IBM and Intel yeah. from having a, a, a lock hold on the software industry and the hardware industry in the combination of having everyone write C code on an x86. And just to be clear, that was your goal at Sun, but we had actually three languages compiling to uh, bytecode by that time, and we were desperately waiting for Hotspot to come to market. <laughs> okay, fine. What were the other two languages? Uh, oh, you're going to I never saw them. I had never heard uh, them. One was basic. It was a proprietary basic, and the other was a, propri a different proprietary basic from Lotus. Go. So back no one ever came to me and ever said, and make this go fast, or this will always happen. If they had, I might have done something different. And oh, I don't so know. Are you talking about changed, Visual Basic yeah. and Visual Basic for applications? On Sun no. JVM. <laughs> one was it's just a, funny one that was Microsoft a, has two a, flavors uh, of Basic. One was a clone of Visual Basic that had been changed enough to avoid lawsuits from Microsoft, supposedly. That was the lowest product. <laughs> And the other was another proprietary basic from a 4GL. And these folks were going to run on a JVM? That oh, yeah. Was the, they had a business design engineering plan to do this. Yeah, yeah. Boy, it never fed back to me. <laughs> I will say, you describe your goal as Intel shouldn't have the luck. Yeah. And at least from my one anecdote of trying to move corporate server side data center yeah. workloads to yeah. ARM. Yeah. We had a lot of Scala code that was JVM and moved it to ARM, and it just worked. Excellent. Whereas when we tried to move Python to ARM, <laughs> oh my God, you have to recompile the world. I didn't realize 
ninety percent of our Python cycles were actually C and C plus plus cycles. Right. Yeah. Just, just to be we clear, tried though, to move just node to, be clear, Aaron, to ARM, and it was move... like, oh my god, all of our node code is C extensions and C plus yeah. plus extensions. Yep. Yep. Just like... to be clear, though, just to move Python to Python on the same OS on the same machine, you're screwed. You mean Python two seven to three one? Oh, change a version, change the runtime. Python like... three point eleven point one to three point eleven point two. Right. Oh, oh but move really? it, move it for, move yeah. from PyPy to you know like, like well, PyPy but, is not the official one, but fine, okay. I get it. Well, that's what I'm saying. Move it from any one to any other one, and yeah, everything right. Fair breaks. Enough. Fair right. So it's Python pain. is about standing on the right foot. Yep. With your left hand in the air while holding something yep. in your right hand while keeping yep. one eye shut. What well, you know, it's, it's it. the yeah, most yeah. fragile Sun, yeah. system ever. This Sun, is what part of really gives me yeah. confidence that AA yeah. could really be adopted and change things because in Python you have to split between two languages because you're writing your business logic in Python and your performance logic in something else. Python and makes Python no, makes you're writing your business logic in JavaScript and your performance logic in something else. The thought of having one language where you can write both most of your code and the code you care about in the same language is yeah. a real advantage. Yeah. So that's where I'm waiting to finish it so, so we can write all yeah. our target languages well, basics. Feel, <laughs> feel free to come screw with the test harness and hand me failures. The test harness should be easy. That should be like a, a, a cut and paste a test and you just put a new program string and a new answer that you expect out. And you run it in the IntelliJ as a J unit, and it will either pass or fail you right away and give you all the, you know, and then I don't care what, after that, you don't have to diagnose or debug or anything. It'll just tell you you're, you got to pass or fail. And you can show me the, throw me, throw me the test case with what you think it ought to have done. So the test harness is good for small snippets of code. Yeah. But is not a good place to work out what should the idioms of this language be and what is the community yeah, so, that you're trying to build. Yeah, I'm, I'm and, talking about the theory theory test harness. The AA main code base test harness right now has just got little syntax snippets. Um, but, I don't have a harness for big shit because I don't have big shit going because I'm still sorting theory out and that's why I don't have a big shit harness. So I can't do anything except parse. I can't type big shit. The well, place where I get stuck on the sort of theory and plan is yeah. that for people who really want performance code, yeah, you want to do allocations early on in the program. And then once you get to hot time, you don't do new allocations inside the hot loops. You're passing around arenas and resource yeah. pools and right. whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas for the quick and dirty, I'm writing some business logic and I don't care. I don't want to start with like create arena. Okay, yeah, yeah, pass yeah. the arena into my function yeah. so that I can allocate strings. Into well, that's the that's the theory that says I have you know it's garbage collection by default, and then you can turn off the garbage collection in a region, and the typing system will tell you if you actually turned it off or you're trying to allocate where you shouldn't be. So that's my question. How do you design a standard library so most of the time I cannot think about resource pools, but also when I need uh, to drive resource pools very deeply through libraries? I, I think I'm going to. Have I don't to necessarily have, want to have yeah. to pass an arena into every function forever always, but I would like no, to no, be no. able to pass arena when I care. Right. Right. So. So. Well. I think what I'm going to do there is say that the libraries themselves either do or do not allocate. And if they're an allocating library and you said GC, you'll get a type error. You said no GC and you're an allocating, you get a type error. And then there's another version of the library, which has an arena, which I probably won't go to right away. And then the reason for that is everyone has a different notion of what an arena is. So that's, that's, I don't know how to allocate in your particular phase of arena or what the invariants are. So there's another version where I'm going to pass things through the library and the at the far end is going to be doing an arena or not. And that one, I'm going to say, use a closure. Right. I basically want to be able to pass allocators into libraries, yeah, except you, when you, I don't care, in which case a, I just uh, don't pass an allocator in and it uses the garbage collector. You have a library that takes an element. You're going to do things with the element. The element you pass in better have its arena baked okay. inside of it. Which just is one closure. remark before we go any further. You do not want to actually accept memory <laughs> allocator. You want to abstract, you want to accept abstract memory source. Because note that you may want to put this allocation outside of some loop, pre-allocate, 
at some stage of your program yeah. and then you just want to reuse this memory resource you already have yeah, yeah so that's just that's on one layer one layer of abstraction now what i'm thinking of in the answer to the library design couldn't you take a defaulted memory source where your default memory source is the gc heap and i'm presuming there is one global gc heap if you are talking about garbage collection by default and then allow the user to opt out to something else um I, I i haven't got that far along i've got as far along as thinking i'm going to say that there's a type for things that allocate and a type for things that don't that don't care obviously so that i can tell you that this library call himself does not allocate or it does now as in an allocating function is a different type than a non-allocating function yes yes well, what, what do you mean by allocate i mean just new you new. Malloc. Anything that's not on the stack. Your resource consumption. Oh, I see. So you could have a function that's mutating existing memory, and that yeah. would not be an allocated. Yeah. A, a class of right. examples, I'm running a big blahs array over a bunch of, you know, big blahs loop over a bunch of big arrays. I always do things functionally, so that's what was confusing me for a while, because I'm always allocating. Right, right. Well, there's this, I did this great talk, and in fact, I'm going to do it again, because I got invited to go do it again, on the cost of allocation. So, Bill, what is the cost of allocation in a garbage collected language? So, this is a trick question, by the geez. way. Cash misses. Yes. And if you if you're looking for that speed up, and I can get easy examples and things that look realistic that I have totally done in the past of five x with no no parallel, no mem map, no nio tricks, just stupid shit five x out of regular code by flipping to a non allocating paradigm in the body of the loop. If I then went parallel, I could times cores. If I did an M map, I get a times two. You know, there, there's more, more to be had, but just not allocating big numbers. But so Matt, Matt remarks also, I believe it's interesting because you can specify from where to allocate. So he there's he, right. There's another version that says this guy either allocates directly or indirectly because he got past. Uh, uh, elements that he's passing through who they themselves in turn will allocate right mm -hmm. and now how do you handle the two cases i allocate i recursively allocate and i allocate means i have to understand your particular api for how i get memory and return it when i'm done if i do or i don't and if i pass through that i don't have to have any knowledge other than to say this whole wad of code including the pass through piece has to be linked against a virtual machine runtime that includes a garbage collector includes the default global garbage collector. Hmm. So one of the theories that I have here is that I'll have a type for this thing touches the global GC at some point, and then I link it against other things, and I do all my typing, and I'm done with my typing. But somebody somewhere in there did an unguarded allocation that may require some kind of a GC. I need to link against a virtual machine that has a GC, as opposed to linking against like bare hardware, because I'm dropping down on a Raspberry Pi, right? Is there a version of that where you just say, I've got this library and uh, I want to instantiate a version of it that's using this memory allocation system, or I want to yes. instantiate a version of it that's GC'd and you just, because right. your type system is pretty flexible for that kind of thing. Yeah, right. So, so there's another version, which I haven't sorted out that I want to go there or not, which says, everyone takes a type argument. The type argument declares the type of the allocation. It's generic for me. All allocators provide a malloc and a free, for instance, and I don't care after that. And and I don't, you know, and if I don't want to do uh, GC, I have to have something I can say about it. And if I want to be polymorphic and I don't care whether you're a GC allocator or not, I want something else out of it. You're 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 giving me a fast wad of memory in a big arena, and you're going to GC for me behind my back outside the loop, which is what Matt just said, which I totally done, and the hotspot compiler does. Yeah, I want to have that as a type that just says. Give me some memory for free, and I'll never call. You know, I can just allocate whenever I want, and I'll never call free. And you'll deal with when I run out. Mm -hmm. And one way to deal is I guarantee that when I call this guy, I hand him enough that he never runs out. That's what Hotspot does. And another version is I call GC, which, of course, you know, the run out means I ran the GC cycle a few billion times and never caught up, and eventually I out of memory you and threw you out. So there's there's a way to do this in the typing system. And then hand in hand with that, there's a way to do it where you pass an extra argument along. The argument is the allocator. And I haven't sorted out if I want to do it, you know, how to do that. 
right which way to go there also think about algorithms where the complexity depends on the memory so i give this example of stable sort where if you are not allowed to allocate memory you have to rely on the helper algorithm that is an in-place sort and unfortunately in-place sort raises your complexity to be n square log n instead of n log n on the other hand if you are allowed to allocate memory inside the algorithm for a temporary buffer you are actually going to have less comparisons because you are able to sort in this extra temporary array so this may be interesting for interface specification where you would like to express both the memory allocation as well as the complexity of the algorithm in the interface because it, you it, kind of are into dependent, dependent type territory or almost uh, I'm definitely refinement in, type i'm definitely in a case where i want to have libraries think about how they allocate as part of their typing so that i could code to a, a spec that said i'm never allocating because i'm going to go down on a raspberry pi i'm writing the kernel yeah, I mean, algo arguably, this shouldn't be a one algorithm. I think that's that's what something I would agree with, that there, there shouldn't be sing single algorithm called stable sort. There should be in place stable sort and allocating stable sort. Right, and, and so right. To... there's an allocating and a non-allocating, and you just put a type, I mean, you just put on the documentation the big O factors for the non-allocating one, yeah. And if I want to add a constraint that says all memory is allocated at compile time, I do yeah, that in that, main, and now if I call allocating anything, I've got a compiler error. Yeah, we, we you 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 have a type constraint uh, that says I can't call allocate, and I'm I'm pre-computing the the names for everything. I don't I don't know that, that there's not a good I don't have a good answer for that one right yet. I'm missing some key pieces. The the pre-allocate means that I have the memory and I want to give it names and hand out the names, and then I don't need to have. You know, this is Derek's case. Everybody got named up front and was all, all done. There's another version which says it comes and goes and comes and goes. And I pick up temporary names for all the little parts, but I keep freeing things, but I'm perfect in my free. And, and so uh, I want to allocate and free, but then I want the non-GC version, which says you give me some temporary space and I'll use it and I'll get it done and I'll be done with it and hand it back. Right. Or you can have cases when you calculate when can you reuse the memory. Well, that's what I meant by hand it back. Oh, yeah. That, that that's you know I'm done. Like like if the reuse is at the end of the arena, what you really said was at the at the end of my algorithm, I just clean the arena and that's the reuse. Mm -hmm. So you hand me an arena and I hand it back to you when I'm done with it and you're free to use it again. I'm, I'm dead. So there's a lifetime management that mm -hmm. I say I'm allocating. I need this much space. It's a ratio of my input somehow. So, you know, it's proportional to my inputs. Okay, fine. Mm. And, and then I'm done. I free it all when I'm done. That's mm. that's definitely an allocation type I want to support. That's very much Rust-like. Yeah, that's what I was going to say to you. Yeah. You need to. No, it's just totally, it. totally there's a version that, that wants to be there. And that I've goes straight up with, with, you know, how to do lifetime management in a Rust-like thing. And that gets into the borrow checker. And can I do something automatic in, in AA's types that makes me get basically the borrow checker style thing going on without me having to put annotations in myself. And, you know, I've seen that in C code where there were functions that were like, this is my global 4K that I've allocated for doing string format so mm -hmm. that I don't have to do any allocations when I do my string format. And if your string right. ever becomes longer than 4K, which most strings don't, right. it won't allocate. Right. It then got me in trouble because it wasn't a thread local, this thing. So if you ah. get two copies of that function that has a single global yes. pool where it's doing the string format, you get some very confusing error messages. Yes. Yes, I've diagnosed similar things. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you also get into this game of, okay, what is needing to be thread local and what is needing to well, be that's, processed that's global? that's concurrency, which is its whole separate set of types. Like I'm, I'm sorting where I'm at now. And when this is done, then I want to go allocation types and I want to go thread local concurrency types. You know, look at Pony as a language spec for doing concurrency and the rules they put in. And they have some reasonable decisions and some less reasonable decisions made, but there's definitely some thought put into how to do concurrency, you know, sort of type safe. Also maybe a good idea to track locality. And I mean locality both in terms of say GPU device memory, because if you have an algorithm working on a GPU, it would be really dumb to pass it a 
memory coming from a CPU. Well, depending on the generation of the GPUs, of course, as well as NUMA nodes. If you have some computation on one NUMA node, you probably do not want to access remote memory from another NUMA node. That one I don't like, like it's much more narrowly defined set of cases where it pays off. Like the payoff is big when it applies, but it's actually tough to get it to apply except in some of the narrow cases. Exactly Derek's doing this. This is this is straight up PEs on whatever GPUs. We did that all the time with H2O with doing neural nets and shit. Yeah. You had to figure out how to meant. And but outside of those cases, you get sort of generic junk business logic. Probably not a way to reasonably track humanish uses and you rely on the x86 caches to do the right thing. There is some work to standardize this. At least I know some libraries for C++ for HPC are working on that because then it's it's very sensitive. I mean, to something like NUMA nodes, yeah. you could yeah. really drastically reduce performance if yeah. you get this wrong. No, I understand the performance hit. That was, you know, 10x. So the Azul answer was, we'll never get it right, so we're not going to try. Instead of being super fast and local and expensive, remote was expensive, we went mediocre everywhere. Local accesses were fairly expensive. Remote accesses were no more. I thought Azul had one giant memory pool. That's not true? Yeah, but the actual hardware implementation was every CPU chip had like four memory channels on it, and they were put in a mesh. And so any one CPU could talk to the memory on some other guy, and he had to go through an X-Link, maybe one or two hops to get to that memory and come back. Well, it turned out that once you got that far, if you wanted to be local, you had to have a special cutoff for the local path, or even Arctoid X-Link, which was your local X-Link. So you talk to your local X-Link if the address has turned out that way, and that, you know, added the latency of an X-Link. So it didn't, you know, it was fairly expensive to be local, but no worse to be remote. And the expectation is you're mostly going to be remote anyhow. So the next step of that one was, uh, oh, fuck. We, we hash hardware hash striped the pages so that you didn't get hotspots uh, except with, you know, unless you inverted the hash function in software. So you got an even distribution across the cluster, which meant that you had bandwidth out the wazoo because everybody had, had four channels. And as soon as you had a bunch of chips, you had a hundred channels and everybody went to all channels. So they spread the load out everywhere and the system was a giant throughput box. We were, you know, top 500 supercomputer bandwidth well under the top, I don't know, so top hundreds or top tens or something. It was way high in the bandwidth category. Um, latency was not great. Bandwidth is enormous. So parallel was the name of the game. But that not great latency was still measured in microseconds. Um, Maybe I have to go. We had numbers for those. I don't have them off the top of my head. Yeah, not not nanos. It was we'll give me micros. Yeah, it was reasonable. It wasn't it wasn't insanely bad or insanely good. It was like I said, it was kind of average. Certainly, we were a lot slower than an x86 doing local, and I think our remote was slower than an x86 doing remote because x86 had more you know engineers and dollars to put on process than we did. Right. I was just thinking at the time that would have seemed slow, but. I've seen a lot of production systems now that are using memcached and are accessing memory across Ethernet on some other box where it's a millisecond and a half if you would like to access that memory. And that's considered yes. pretty good. Yeah, no, we're, we're definitely better than millisecond. Uh, and, you know, you could have thousands of outstanding cache loads running, cache misses running across the box all at once. So that was all fine. All right. Well, here we are. Two hours in. We had a wild run on typing things. Um, I don't know if I'll have variants next week, examples put together, but if people want to talk about something else, I'm totally good with that. Although apparently it was exciting to a bunch of people. So maybe, you know, we'll be back around to give me an example in the pure lambda calculus that shows variance. Fine. Anyone else? Anything else? We'll include cats and dogs just for and Cameron. cats and dogs just just for Cameron. <laughs> I'll give him a puppy for Christmas. Boy, he doesn't like them. He's ignoring me studiously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I still think provides and requires is easier terminology to understand than covariant and contravariant. I pasted in some interesting code. Oh, oh, oh! He's trying to trying to keep us going here. No, no. 
No, no, not for not for today. I'm saying. Oh, I thought you threw in something. Module permutations. This sounds like uh, Cliff Cameron. Yeah, this sounds like Cameron here. Permute an item. This is like count the permutations or make a random one. Uh, yeah, I was calculating. I I was working on a project the other day where I had to come up with a set of permutations, and uh, I looked at the algorithms for it, and I was like, these suck. So Isn't I noticed it... a pattern. It's basically a factorial. Well, so you did just a factorial. It's just a factorial. Are you going to print them all out? I can't find any. I can't find anyone who's done it this way. So I was like, weird. I can't be the. You know, like there's so many clever. Okay. Things Where is your permute? Oh, I, you're recursively calling yourself. Yes, but there's only a single. In yeah. other words, it's not recursively recursive. It's just oh. recursive. Yeah, permute calls permute. It's like right. the factorial is. Right, exactly. That's oh, why I, I said see. it's like factorial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. One one level. It's not Fibonacci, which does it both sides. It's one level. Yeah, okay. Which means there's a loop version somewhere in the universe. And you walk your patterns, and you add things, or you don't, or whatever. And you make a new capital I int, a, oh, int array, and you throw things in, and you result that add, which is an int int array. It was add on a int array array. Do a like are your capital I int arrays have variable sized things? Are they fixed sized? Are they Java yes. arrays or all, JavaScript all the, arrays? All the above. Um, what are you using in the example? I think both. Give me just a second to swap back to the tab. Where the heck is that? CCC. Yeah. Here we go. So, uh, which line number? <laughs> um, I, I yeah. I tried so to that highlight one, that one. Is a uh, result is a variable length array of int arrays. Okay, and, and a variable length array is like an array list in Java. That's like an array list exactly. Okay, it behaves as if it's an array list. Yes. Okay. Where are you yeah, getting your right. entropy for the new order? I don't see a call to like random or an integer. No, he's coming it, in. iterating them all, so it's not random. Exactly. He, he's ah, you up. want the entire n factorial yeah, permutation. Yeah. Give me the yes, yes. That could have a long runtime for some lists. Yes. Well, well it's factorial. Give an example of six, so that's probably not too bad. Yeah, I mean, it's a factorial. Like, I had I had a longer yeah. list, but the output was ridiculous. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to look at the output. Thank you. Yeah, so if you look at that, um, there's actually two different arrays there in the line you highlighted. Result is an array, but then yeah. I also create a new fixed length array where yeah. this this constructor takes one parameter. It takes the parameter i, sorry, not the, the array, but it, it gives my lambda the i of which element to fill in. Oh, okay. and, I, yeah. and I give it a value from that lambda to stick into the new so, array. So you run that function as a map call over the new array you just made. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Right. I, I would use, I would, I would name array, uh, array list, uh, variable length arrays different than fixed arrays because of the cost trade offs myself. Of course. And the, the, the we, iterator. We do, not, we do not, we do not raise that awareness into the language itself. So it's still from the point of view of the developer, it's still the same array class for, for, yeah, I, I fell over hard on Julia doing this problem where I wanted to have fixed length string arrays and he was only going to give me variable length arrays and the extra overhead of the variable length caused a Boyer Moore search algorithm to do an SQL query added like tenfold to the cost of doing the damn fucking SQL query. It was ludicrous. It was That's one of the TCPH benchmarks go find one of these seven strings in a terabyte of data and, and keep increasing the data to explode. I am definitely not your person to defend any Julia decisions whatsoever. Yeah. Well, Julia made some interesting decisions. I, I'll tell you that. That is it, one way to put it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's obviously there's a lot of brilliance behind it, but brilliance by people who never wrote code. Oh, I'm going to get quoted on yeah, that. Yeah. Never did I? performance for a living. Yeah. I, yeah, I went and tried to make it go fast. And the answer was hard limits on how fast you could oh, go. It's, it's really stupid. easy. The, the people who wrote Julia have 7,000 core 12 terahertz machines and uh, and 75 quadrabytes of, of RAM. Memory. Yes. The same as 
And I'm mm -hmm. saying, I'm saying the guys who were using it did not have that, but they had decent x86s. But I got big number of speed ups by doing stupid shit, including getting rid of the fucking Julia strings. And there were big factors of speed up involved there. And I'm like, you know, why do you have terabytes of blah, 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 if you're pissing it all away on this kind of stuff? Fine. Fine. Done. Anyway. Yep. It, that makes me, that reminds me of a topic that I was thinking about lately, which is, you know, and it kind of came up earlier, uh, you know, there are all these new languages targeting the JVM. And they sort of, my understanding of languages like Scala is that they sort of have their own compiler, but they're really just compiling to bytecode. So it's really pre-compiling and then the JIT takes it from there. In the case of Scala specifically, they do a lot of work to get it down to bytecodes. Yeah. It is a non-trivial compiler, but it's very complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and then Clojure, on the other hand, has a very trivial one-pass compiler. <laughs> right, right. And um, there are a bunch of folks that fall in that camp too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking about closure and and performance and stuff and, and thinking, I wonder if it would be possible to do a kind of compiler with a similar architecture, like what I'm building now, like a C of nodes compiler, but which produces bytecode, but with specific insight into closure. So, so I could do things like, yeah. well, I know these types that you're using and I can look to see if this uh, immutable array, you know, vector, is escaping from this code and how it's being used. And then I'm going to turn it into an actual array. Yeah. And, yeah. and like basically sp like make closure really fast. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if it would be possible. It's just sort of. No, it, like, it could and should be possible. Yeah. I, I've talked to Rich Hitchy about what goes on in closure and what they're doing and not doing. There, there's a lot of room there for doing good stuff. Yeah. 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 So for it's, any it's language that can be a future hobby. Ideas. There is a there is a staircase on the complexity and there is a cliff because you have to make your yeah. language a JVM compatible. Well, and you get, you, yeah, and you get you it. Well, to, but you're generating bytecode, so yeah. But the semantics of your language have to match the semantics of the JVM. Right. That yeah. that's the well, trick that comes bites you, people in the ass. Yeah, 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 yeah. My thinking is okay. Well, there is a kind of existing closure compiler yeah so then just like you know basically when something gets too hairy you just fall back yeah know, so. you you will probably have more trouble falling back it would not be non-trivial to fall back to another compiler because you'll have to have all the invariants of that compiler and all the invariants of yours align mm -hmm. up and and yeah. what you would just hit is a spot where you couldn't figure out how to have your invariants but the invariants you have have to be turned into the invariants of the other guy. It, it, it's, right. it can be done. I'm not saying don't. I'm just warning you. There is a there is a the transition to the fallback case has its own issues. It's a uh -huh. great place to get there though, and it does put constraints on you. But it does let you then skip shit you don't want to deal with. Right. It's what the hotspot does with things he doesn't want to deal with. He calls the interpreter. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to like, deal without a memory. I'm just going to bail out from the generated code and the interpreter will sort it out. I don't yeah, deal with class loading. Yeah, uh, the interpreter uh, will sort it out. And the, the other thing that I was thinking regarding this was there's already a full profiler, right? So I don't like I could basically. You don't get use the, the JVM files. I don't. You can't. I thought the. the um, there are all these interfaces that give you a fairly detailed profiling information. You can go, you can go profile, but you don't get the core internal profile yeah. data directly out to use in your compiler. Oh, you don't. Not that I know. Like maybe, maybe now they do. I mean, I mean the the Azul had it a long time ago, and we couldn't get people to take it, so fine. And then the the what what the hell's the the run the rocket folks the J rocket folks did with the flight report. Um, yeah. Some of that I, I, I you might be able to pull out for profiles, maybe. So I, I retract. I, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, there are. are I, you know, I haven't looked into this stuff, and it's just a sort of vague idea. But uh, there are. I do occasionally do profiling, and when I turn on the profiler, it doesn't seem to cause any noticeable impact on the program's performance. So, I mean. Yeah. Maybe it's because the program's not fast enough anyway. But um, 
You know, so it seems like there's some fast profile available data available. The, the, the hotspot internal profiling is far faster than what all the external add-on profilers ever attempted. And mm -hmm. they eventually got somewhat better and they all had their issues. Um, right. There is ways if you're under the hood to profile much more cheaply than people who are coming from the outside. Uh -huh. uh, fine. I don't know. The, the, it, it triggers a hot button in me. I just need to get over it. The JVM TI guys, the PI, TI, DI guys never talked to me. And, and especially the performance profiling guys like didn't talk to me and they came up with a stupid ass API and I heard about it and I walked in on the meetings and said, what's going on with this? And I was like, oh, this is dumb. You'll never get any performance out of this. So it'll slow, slow it so much that it will blow your profiles. Um, you know, I, 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 you can't do that. And I have this information available already in another way. And they like right. shot me the bird and said, get out of here. I said, okay. So they came up with, a, with an API and it sucked really bad and everyone hated it. And like two years later, they flipped and threw it away and came up with another one and then another one. And they never got a never get, they got better and better, but they never had what you could get for free right then and right there had they talked to me. You know, fine. So that was my hot button. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the standard wisdom is you get what you pay for. I mean, you don't want something free. Come on. Jeez. All right. <laughs> fine. Yeah. Free was better in this case, but all right, fine. Yeah, I know. Just kidding. Yeah. So um, next time, next time, bring bring it up. So instead of me going on AA type theory, bring up. No, bring no, up. it's interesting. And oh, um, just like a quick update, I I uh, I actually started. You know, I've kind of moved past the basic reduce rules in my compiler, um, and I, so I started doing the next ones. And I realized that, you know, I was I was having annoyances about more complex rules happening when some simplifications are still available. And so I, I just did exactly what we talked about last time, the, the shrink, uh, sorry, the reduce mono grow mm -hmm. split up the rules. Mm -hmm. It took like an hour to sort of just go through each one and decide which file it goes in and, uh, works great. Yeah. It worked on the first, first run. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. It's, it's nice. So, uh -huh. Excellent. Yeah. And so I've got some like decent, I've got some fairly complex programs now that I compile and it just, the output is here's the result of the program. And <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's good. And I don't even have inlining in yet. So I'm, I'm all excited. Excellent. So, Excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, yeah. let's, let's wrap it and call, call it next week then. All right. All right, gentlemen. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye.